Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is a podcast where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and discuss our analysis and research findings. I uh, will be your host uh, today. I'm Platon Skull. My name, uh, that's my name. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and t- today we're going to be discussing Howl's Moving Castle, uh, directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, from 2004 uh, and it's his uh third to most recent uh film like we're getting closer to the present but we won't catch up for a while it seems um with me in uh the podcast uh we have of course uh Nyad. hey i'm Nyad. my pronouns are he him and uh i'm the delightful cult of this youtube channel here i hope all right uh we have a uh, tasu Hi, my name is Tasu. I go by she day. I sometimes draw. I sometimes watch anime. We have a uh, hipster Cthulhu once again. Uh, he, him, and back at you. And I'm the uh, the fat little dog. Don't remember the name <laughs> of this monster <laughs> cast. Heen. Heen, that's it. I'm the Heen. <laughs> All right. And uh, new to the uh, monster cast, we have Voice Flower. Thanks. You can call me Voice. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really excited to be here. All right. So, Howl's Moving Castle uh, is uh, the uh, director uh, Hayao Miyazaki's follow-up to the huge breakthrough, uh, at least in the West, uh, Spirited Away, and like record breaker, uh, box office juggernaut. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, I think, to many in the West, it's the se- like the second uh, Ghibli film that was like really visible and had like a. a big premiere that people were excited for. Uh, so so it is like, I think it's like relatively more well-known and well like regarded in the West than uh, than in Japan. But that that might just be my personal uh, biases uh, talking there. It might, it might just be my personal bias, but I f- it was the first Ghibli movie I ever saw on a burned DVD when I was like six years old. So, you know, that's, that's just how much it uh, has an impact. Yeah. Damn, you just made Miyazaki very sad. Like pirating his movies, bad. <laughs> I didn't pirate it. <laughs> Someone else did. You just, I think you uh, made Suzuki mad, not Miyazaki. <laughs> I, I, I guess good, good Suzuki point. Miyazaki would probably also. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Maybe Miyazaki's like, fuck yeah, pirate. Yeah. Well, sp- speaking of uh, the great master uh, Miyazaki, this um, this is an adaptation uh, of uh, a book that Miyazaki really uh, enjoyed. Uh, by uh, Diane Wynne Jones, uh, British author. Uh, she is British, right? Not not American. Right. Yeah, yeah, British. British author. Um, she studied and, uh, uh, with C.S. Lewis. Hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that, that's uh, pretty interesting, and it is kind of a loose adaptation. Uh, it does add and uh, change and uh, some subtract quite a few things. I haven't. Uh, personally uh read it but uh but voice you said you you had read it uh when you were younger yeah i read it when i was uh an adolescent so <laughs> it's been quite a few years now but it is it's a really wonderful uh sort of uh novel children's literature and um uh you know fantasy but in 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 the way that the fantasy reflects the psychological condition of the characters and the 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 conflicts are all about that so it's a it's a great read mm. yeah and i hear it's like very <clears throat> the commentary i've read on it is mostly that it's like deconstructing gender roles a little bit presenting like alternative views especially of older women which we also have in this movie right like definitely um and that is that seems to be the one of the things that clicked with miyazaki and diane Wynne jones so there's this cute little anecdote that when um <clears throat> proposing that miyazaki would uh, make this movie. Diane Wynne Jones had actually already been a fan of Miyazaki's work since Castle in the Sky, or rather, since she saw Castle in the Sky. Yeah, like on, um, on some like, and she was like, like wow, once again, on some bootleg yeah. v, uh, VHS some, somewhere in the yeah. uh, late 80s. She was she also means, pirate. He does approve of pirating, yeah. yeah. yeah so just out. imagine like an author and like 10, 15 years later, Miyazaki approaches you like, hey, 
I'll adapt your your book. Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be a wild thing. But yeah, apparently, like at first, like a Japanese representative came over to talk to Diane Wynne Jones. But afterwards, even Miyazaki personally met, and they apparently devoured a big cake and talked. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently, there was yeah. about a year and a half of radio silence between them. So Diana Wynne yeah. Jones was uh, wasn't sure if the production was going smoothly or not, or going as planned. But you know, it's also interesting. Yeah, I think Miyazaki yeah, came yeah. over to show her the final film. Yeah, right? that's yeah. that's what was. Uh, was planned there. So. Also, there was a weird production thing where originally Mamoru Hosoda was like uh, said to be the director of this film, but like oh, yeah, he left weird. and made his own studio. Yeah, correct. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that how he's he's seen by a lot of people as kind of like maybe you know a Miyazaki successor, and he makes a lot of kind of similar <laughs> family movies. So it's interesting that Miyazaki would take over the project he was definitely working on. Yeah. Mm. Um, also, another little interesting bit between Diana Wynne Jones and and Miyazaki is that um, the the sequel novel to Diana Wynne Jones's book Howl's Moving Castle is called Castle in the Air, and oh, <laughs> it's plot wise it has very little to do or almost nothing to draw parallels to Castle in the Sky, the film by Miyazaki. But uh, but I think it's it is interesting. Maybe Miyazaki. Also read that. Uh, no, no. Um, <laughs> Castle in the Air was released in uh, original published in uh, in 1990. So that's after. Oh, uh, uh, I see. Okay. Laputa. So it's, still, it's I, an I, interesting thing coincidence. They, they just yeah. It, it might like it, it. It might be that like she managed to watch the film and was inspired by it at that point. Um, but like bootleg VHS, that sounds like like might be. Uh, uh, into the 90s uh, at that point, but it's probably 90s yeah. because. But to be sure, like I, I don't know how how much like uh, VHS tapes of Miyazaki movies were around in the US in the uh, US in Britain in the eighties. That sounds like not the time yet. Yeah, but like I, th mm. I think it, uh, in that case, it really points to that these two creators have like this weird affinity for each other, That's which right. which is con like kind of confirmed uh, in in interviews with uh, Diane Wynne Jones, where she she has uh, expressed that uh, in her conversations uh, through an interpreter with Miyazaki. Um, like like during the process of uh, the adaptation, uh, he seemed to understand, uh, at least according to her, he understood her books like really well. Like uh, I, I think a, a quote is like no one else did. Yeah, like yeah. no one else did. Like he, he read them from the inside out. Is a is also a quote from her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. Well, a lot of critics have noted that the movie changes tremendously some aspects of the original book, maybe even like so far as implying or stating that this makes it lesser. Diana Wynne Jones will hear nothing of this. She's like, nobody understood my characters ever so well, and I love it. Like, basically, that it's it's really good. Yeah. Right. Miyazaki did actually get the cast love and flying right at the end. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I guess yeah. That's oh yeah. I was I was gonna say that if we got to the end, talking about the ending, but yeah, it's gonna be the most Miyazaki thing. Yeah, we'll, in the whole uh, we'll, film, we'll, we'll where definitely just right get at the end. That. The castle can now fly. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 like that's um that that's at least a, a good excuse to talk about what gets added in the adaptation, which is of course like the animation uh, and creativity of Miyazaki. Like there's a lot of original like scenes and like visual ideas uh, that aren't like mm. directly related to the um to the book uh, according to an interview uh with uh, Diane Wynne Jones like her like concept of the uh, of the castle it, it it was like she thought it would be like floating a bit and and be like covered in in like black coal or something like that it's very different from the creation that uh, Miyazaki came up with and there's a lot of like these smaller like bits of like magic and the the falling stars and stuff like that that mm. just uh they didn't necessarily come wholesale from Miyazaki, but like were were like made to as like a, a visual spectacle on top of the the narrative uh, whimsy, uh, so to speak. Yeah, that, yeah. When Jones even commented on that, she didn't like uh, think of the castle as like that is not what I've written was her first right. reaction to it. But later she like came around to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which, I, I mean, I, yeah. There was a really. Um, it's an interesting review of the film by Antonia Levi, uh, and, and in that she she wrote that mm, for those who are familiar with the book and the film, watching Howl's Moving Castle is a bit like reading very good fan fiction. 
Oh yeah, oh, that's that, that's an interesting I, way of looking at uh, a loose adaptation. Right, but there's that, that yeah, inherent that. in in you know understanding of the characters that Win Jones noted. So I wonder. Wait, hold on. Is this like Miyazaki adapts a ton of like pre pre existing works? I think this is the first time we actually have like commentary by the original author on it, right? Um, yes, there isn't some interesting commentary on uh, Earthsea, but of course that was Goro's film uh, oh, by yeah, the author yeah, Ursula Le Guin. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I don't I don't know of any times when uh, I haven't seen any interviews about the authors. I mean, I, I guess we. In Grave of the Fireflies, we had this one interview with the original author of Grave of the Fireflies right, yeah, before yeah. Takahata made the movie. But I think that's about it. And it's really interesting to have like the perspective of adaptation, but from the different side. Like, of course, there are some infamous examples where, for example, like Stephen King hates the adaptation of China, of The Shining, which everyone loves. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like interesting situations. But here we actually have like the original author and the director of the adaptation in sync, which is also like a nice, beautiful thing to see. And I guess Wynne Jones... Diana Wynne Jones approved of the transformation of the characters. And I guess the main transformation thing that happened in the adaptation is, well, the war, right? The the war element is, I don't think, completely absent from the original novel, but a massive like expansion and addition by Miyazaki yeah. in the movie. Because it's basically what the film like yeah. narratively and that's, mostly uh, is impacted by. You know, so, yeah, if I, well, if I well, recall uh, correctly, yeah. it says something about there being a plot about like a missing prince from a different kingdom or something, and that's kind of like causing tension. But Miyazaki mm -hmm. turns this into a, like a, an all out war yeah. with like air raid bombings and stuff. So it's like yeah, and, 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 and yeah, in noticeable the... departure in tone. And in the early uh, in the early arts, like what what reason could he have had? Possibly. I want. I wonder that. what was happening. Yeah, because like we, we, we're I speaking of like senseless war. Yeah, we we're speaking of like the interviews uh, that are available from Dan Wynne Jones's perspective, which which are very mm -hmm. valuable. But there are, really aren't a lot of interviews with Miyazaki, which is interesting this, because that guy loves to yeah. talk about stuff. It's it's insane because okay, so Turning Point by Hayao Miyazaki is the sequel to Starting Point. Starting Point basically covered the first part of his career. Turning Point is about the next part, or basically from uh, Mononoke Hime to, uh, you know, uh, 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 Wind Rises or Ponyo. I think Ponyo is the last part in that. Um, and like, when we did Mononoke Hime, Turning Point was the greatest source I could have ever asked for. Like, I, I when you, if you listen to that cast, you'll probably hear me quote Miyazaki interviews non-stop like because he talked about this so much somehow for howl's moving castle so the chapters and turning point are structures like this part one mononoke Himo, part two spirited away part three howl's moving castle the entire 100 pages of interviews in and around the time that howl's moving castle was released i don't think i found a single mention of howl's moving castle the chapter is titled Howl's Moving Castle. Not a single reference. Not the proposal document like we usually get. Not like interviews with whomever he wants to talk about. No. And it turns out that Miyazaki at this time was really, really, really pissed for multiple reasons. For one, like he had just gotten the Academy Award in the US. Yep. But he was really angry at the US for starting the Iraq war it's to the point where he didn't go there, where he didn't actually like think much of it. He felt conflicted of even accepting the award in light of like his disapproval of the US. Like that was right. a huge inner thing for him. But then also he was kind of mad at Toshio Suzuki for like the advertising campaign for Spread It Away. He was like, okay, Suzuki, tell me, is this movie so successful and beloved because people like it or because of the marketing campaign? And apparently like one brave staffer said, well, you know, I think the, the, the marketing campaign was really significant. Then Miyazaki was just angry and said, okay, no marketing campaign for Howells. No. <laughs> <laughs> what a mad lad. So that's, that's like the anecdote. That's something so you can also, only get away with yeah. when you're like the big name auteur director of, uh, of the company. Like that, that's, that's, yeah, just, that's yeah. such a like, I do what I want move. I mean, honestly. Mm. And he didn't, he really didn't give a fuck. Like that means he didn't give interviews. Like he just refused mostly to give interviews about Howells. He refused to make like public events and he's, he like cut down on marketing tremendously. And he was of the opinion that this would lead to a state, not just because of the topic matter in the film with the depictions of war as they are, but also because of the lack of marketing. He thought genuinely this movie would fail in the US. He was wrong. Yeah, he was very I mean, it wrong. It didn't quite match the numbers of Spirit Away, but it was really high up there. Like his name was already recognized yeah. enough that the marketing did itself. Well, I, yeah, think, yeah. I think Lasseter uh, kind of, he, he he wasn't willing to to just let it flop. 
Yeah, he he, uh, he he also has an executive producer credit on the uh, on yeah. House. I mean the the voice oh, cast yeah, sure. on on the English release is uh, on the English dub is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, with uh, Christian Bale as Howl uh, and uh, and a, a double uh, t- two voice actors for for uh, Grandma Sophie and younger Sophie, uh, right. which is it's Emily Emily Mortimer as the young Sophie and uh, Gene Simmons. Uh, yeah, yeah, G- Gene Simmons as uh, the old Sophie. Um, d- Gene Simmons uh, from Kiss. <laughs> I I I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then there's Billy Crystal as Calcifer, who who I think oh, yeah, offers a wonderful characterization. Yeah. Uh, o- o- oh, also, yeah. like Christian Bale doing his Batman voice uh, as like the transformed uh, Howl, like give it, giving us a preview of uh, Batman Begins, which is a few years later. Right. I, th- yeah. I, th- I think it's like just a couple of years later, actually. He was, he was practicing his husky voice maybe that's why he got hired. it's the very next year <laughs> batman begins 2005 so. yeah it really it really doesn't work because christian bale is like is, is is yeah he's too gruff and howl's kind of more like a pretty fuck boy like it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't match well at all yeah oh but but i have no i have to say this i watched i watched it in both versions english dub ones japanese dub ones um i think christian bale did a good job as how like he i was surprised like how soft he could speak yeah. and like how gentle yeah. he could make him appear make Howl appear at times so, so it was actually a good uh, casting i think billy crystal was Calcifer was pretty good actually. Yeah, yeah. That was a great I thought casting. he did the job really, really fun. well. And was it? It was Gene Simmons also being like old Sophie. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's Though I think, of course, the effect is lost quite a bit because I can't remember her name. But the uh, the the Japanese Sayu for Sophie is like she does the voice as old and young Sophie. Right. So you can like hear her mm-hmm. Chieko, change her Chieko, intonation. Uh, Baisho, uh, is her name. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the. They got two actresses for Sophie in English, yeah. which kind of I think uh, spoils the effect just a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I think like one one thing uh, about the dub I want to also like mention here is like the accents, like Sophie, like bo- both voice actresses give her this like decidedly like uh, like British reserved voice. Um, yeah, but like the rest of the cast, except for her family speak with like whatever like vaguely american accent is, is standard for voice acting you know in hollywood it's even odder because um if i remember reading like the background of the book uh in the book howl is canonically from wales and right. so is christian bale so he should have just done his normal voice <laughs> instead of like his hollywood american wow, voice yeah. that's an interesting point yeah um no, I, I just found found it like kind of strange because I was like, oh, okay, so so they're doing like British because it's like a, a, a British fairy tale thing going on. But no, they it's 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 just Sophie and her uh, mom and sister that are doing that. Yeah, and I guess just a few more keynotes on the on the production just to get to, to bring the whole sort yeah, yeah. point out a little bit more because we like a little bit glossed over that um so the production or rather the announcement of this movie was in 2001 alongside the cat returns like cat returns house moving castle were announced at the same time this would have been even uh was that even september 2001 i think spirit away came out right around that time also so since 2001, Hosoda has been working on it, or rather was slated at some point, uh, uh, hired from Toei Animation to direct the movie. So the story goes, and there's not a lot of accounting of what actually happened because not a lot of interviews were given about this, but it appears that Miyazaki rejected a ton of Hosoda's proposals and concept ideas for what to do with the novel. And then the film was shelved. Uh, it is said that uh, whenever it is talked about why Hosoda was uh, was fired, basically what is brought up is there were troubles. The English word, even the <laughs> English word, Turaburu. <laughs> and I guess, you know, there must have been troubles. Hosoda then, of course, never worked again with Studio Ghibli and became his own Ghibli onto himself, yeah. as Hipster already mentioned. But it seems this can be added to the list of things that made Miyazaki angry. <laughs> yeah, well. All right, so... um. With that out of the way, uh, getting back to the the matter of Miyazaki being miffed about the uh, the Iraq War, right? Um, yeah. that's a huge influence on, on on the movie. Like you mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's a whole like added uh, the core theme actually of the of the movie is uh, this war that's going on. 
uh, it, it it takes place in, uh, in instead of like specifically like Wales uh, and thereabouts. Uh, it's just a pan European like uh, fairy tale ish land where they're, they're just like witches and wizards out there, you know, doing their thing, yeah. selling their Again. stuff. And uh, there's a, there's the, there's a king and a uh, and a whole uh, goddamn uh, kingdom, which like the technology seems to be like somewhat like 1800s uh early 1900s maybe so uh, a note about the technology and now actually i wish i had written down this word okay albert robida yeah albert robida uh robida whatever french illustrator from the uh i guess mid 19th century that's if you like look up albert robida and look at image pictures drawn by him miyazaki actually like explicitly used his stuff as an influence mm. because it is like a yeah. envisioning of the future from the mid 19th century perspective wow. and if you like scroll through these images you will recognize a lot of like the flying machines and the towns how they're structured yeah, the, 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 and like the, the, exactly the, the kind flying of, machines yeah, yeah. How fascinating. And the pan, pan-European kind of like uh, uh, architecture and stuff like that. So this is one of the explicit influences on House Moving Castle. And it shows, it's a really, I, I generally like, just to bring this up here, I find the idea of visions of the future as conceived of in the past so fascinating because you look at these and it's like, yeah, this is like some wild shit that they were imagining. Like all this like glorious like eight nineteenth century architecture, but we have like weird flying <laughs> machines that are very ornately decorated and like how lights are integrated into everything because they were still like thinking of early electrical lights and like huge bulbs and shit. It's really cool. Like I like this. This is yeah. There's even a blast an, from the past. There's even an actual <laughs> appearance of giant bulbs that seem to like be magical uh, in in the film uh, with the Witch of the Waste uh, in the castle. Anti magical. In the uh, <laughs> yeah yeah and and to, uh, I, I suppose so um, yeah uh, but, but what what I was uh, getting at is he um, we we have we have these uh, kingdoms that like that are going to war. Um, one one uh, kingdom in which most of this, uh, I think all of the story takes place uh, in in the same uh, uh, kingdom, where uh, we 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 see all these military parades, uh, especially at the beginning, and then like we hear uh, whispers from background characters about a, a prince being uh, having disappeared and that being an excuse for for an invasion, and then uh, the. The, the the king like calls for for all the witches and wizards in the land to serve their country, uh, which Hal is very very like he does not want any of that. He just wants no. his freedom, and oh, he th- yeah. and he knows that the war is senseless. Uh, yeah, he's a pacifist oh, yeah. at heart. Yeah. yeah, well, but but like a pacifist at heart who still like goes and fucks some shit up on the battlefield. Exactly, a, a pacifist. And a coward. <laughs> That's kind of like a dual meaning we clearly are being given here. Yeah. Like now the idea that he's very, a coward comes up again and again. Very childish too. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that this, you know, how in in his relationship with uh with the wor- within the world that he's in, his society specifically, uh very much has the same sort of mm, attitudes toward it as say uh you know Marco from from Porco Rosso in, in that his way of, you know, dealing with the anxieties of, of his society is, is by running away from it. And then when he's faced with no choice, but to, but to turn and fight, he, he, he becomes the very thing that he hates. Yeah. There's an- yeah. another interesting parallel there with uh, the, the, the whole uh, Porco Rosso, like, be becoming this pig person, um, and 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 with how like so, like gradually losing his humanity, which which is another like core theme is transformation, which we'll get deeper into uh, further on in, in the in the cast. But um, but I, th- I think it's, it's it's an interesting contrast there because it, 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 in a way, I does the story kind of posit that. Fighting against it, like in the way that Howlis is actually like unhealthy, and just getting away from it with his uh, like adopted family is the right thing to do. 
I think. Oh, uh, it's, it's complicated. I think it's complicated. I think, yeah, the story doesn't have a lot of like like strong answers on this because it's such like a big, uh, complicated topic. Though I would say, yeah, I, I do feel like the the comparison to Porco Rosso really works, particularly because we have these witches and wizards who are kind of these bizarre like free spirits, like Porco and the pirates, mm-hmm. and they just kind of want to live in their own world and kind of like bring this kind of unique kind of joy and magic to like people. But the, the 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 fascist governments, of course, have to like just completely crush that. And it's like you're either part of the war effort or you're uh, you're not. Which is, I believe, uh, Miyazaki specifically was like angry at yeah George W. Bush saying uh, you're with us or you're with the terrorists. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the and that's jingoism. how the wizards are treated in this uh, society. And I think that the, this oh. film really uh, it, it doesn't have a solution of of the you know on war it doesn't have a societal solution is what i'm trying to say it it, it mostly focuses yeah. on how does one deal with the internal uh conflict which the anxieties and the you know injustices and inhumanity of war in our world uh inflicts on on you know the personal you know soul inside of howl and i think that that relationship um, with war is very reflective of Miyazaki's own. I, I wanted to read a, just like a couple lines of the interview from mm. that he did with Newsweek, uh, which is one of the only extant interviews that he did about the movie. Uh, and I don't, Nyard said this may not even be a full transcript, but uh, Devin Gordon asks in an interview, Ghost in the Shell director Mamoru Oshii cl- claims that deep down you dream of destroying Japan and making movies with lots of bloodshed. Miyazaki responds, he laughs, it's not that I want to destroy Japan, it's that I predict it will be destroyed. Oshii and I are friends, so we always diss each other. Gordon asks, okay, but what makes him suspect you have such feelings about Japan? Miyazaki says, maybe it's because I say things like, oh, I wish the big earthquake would just hurry up and get here. He laughs. My thoughts are very pessimistic, yes, but my general state of being is very positive. There's obviously that's, that's, a paradox here. It's so Miyazaki core. I mean, are you kidding? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's also yeah. so this movie core, right? Absolutely, like, it's because, the rage against yeah. the that you know war and the senselessness. But but it's this feeling of hey, what is what good is it if I just let rage build up inside of me? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and we have yeah. these characters dealing with it in in, in very very d- different ways. I, I'm, I'm thinking of like when everything is getting like bombed uh, to shit and uh, the like the government is after them howl just like it's just like well time to, time to move and he moves into a place that just a, a day later is, is getting bombed the shit out of you know uh, right. like, he, he runs away again and yeah. shows that running away doesn't help but there's, but there's still uh-huh. this joy and jovialness to the whole process of transforming the house to make room for for everyone and mm. uh, and, yeah. and and he he even like goes out with uh with sophie and shows her that like beautiful flower field and it's like I, I, i'm i'm giving you something because i appreciate you and it's all like yeah that's fine and dandy but like it's it seems like you're going to die and of course not even that place is safe from the like the war machine which arrives immediately there's, there's right. this really interesting tension between that whole um the the, the whole found family fairy tale yeah. and the industrialized war machine yeah uh, the, the, that's yeah. the idyllic whir- lifestyle the of you know peaceful getting away from society it's 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 impossible yeah well yeah, yeah. and, and i think it's movie... pretty telling particularly um with the character turnip who is surprisingly seemingly to kind of like a like a gag like a really cute uh, scarecrow that hops yeah. about everywhere just a quick side note it turns um, out, um, turnip is my fucking boy <laughs> <laughs> i just love that i love that dumb old sc- scarecrow i love him every every second he's on screen is a delight sorry just there's a lot of like the little subtle lines throughout the movie about what's causing this war there's like oh it's it's a prince or something and it's like there's even one scene where i think it looks like it, it, it's a real quick shot, but they're just like flying over the town and it looks like there's almost rioting in the streets by like the the, the public of the city, just like again mad about this whole stupid war. And then right at the end, it turns out that Turn Up the Scarecrow was the missing prince that was kind mm. of the cause of this whole thing. And so it's like while this big massive war was going on, while all these lives were wasted, just this simple little scarecrow that only Sophie took the time to like 
pay attention to and care for ended up being the solution for it. Like they weren't out looking for the prince. They weren't like they didn't find him anywhere. No, I think so they weren't really like. That's right. I think it's they very weren't really important. like doing what they could to understand the kind of magical world around it and the kind of like family that eventually Turnip is a part of. Right. Well, I think I think that there's a big point being made about the fact that, uh, you know, Prince Justin is transformed into a scarecrow, and then it's in the paper. Oh a prince is missing, I think they're going to start a war over it, which is in the background of, of the scene in which Sophie, after being transformed into an old woman, is is sneaking out of her own house so as not to bother anybody. Um, so it's it's already that, you know, this sort of conflict is, is in the backdrop, but uh, I think it's very telling that there really isn't anybody out searching for the prince. It's It's just a pretense it's, to yeah, start it's, it's a an ex- war. Yeah, pretext, yeah. An it's excuse. a pretext. It's it's an excuse and it's you know, the the government uh as you know characterized by Solomon and the king um later on is is shown to be extremely apathetic to the you know the commoners and um, you know, the king's even hyped. He likes it. He wants oh to like, God, have yeah. more war, kill more wizards and witches yeah. that don't join the yeah, cause. I, th- fuck I think fuck the em. king is very much uh, a commentary on George W. Bush. That's- yeah, he has like two lines mm-hmm. and, and you're immediately like, that idiot, of course. Like, yeah. how else could this have I, I, this I, I, There's one line that's straight up. There's a magical barrier over the castle, aka White House, that like it just deflects bombs to well, like assumably where just poor people right. live. Right, so like, hits, the entire uh, the yeah. reason they have wizards and witches just to keep him mm-hmm. safe. But, but I think the movie is making a big point, and that's really crucial to understanding the function of war in this movie by leaving every reason for the war so opaque and so like almost like completely senseless because like Mm -hmm. if we think about the function of Howell like Howell has in this castle all these doors to the different cities yet on every door like the messenger of the king knocks and says you gotta come wizard you gotta come you gotta come we need you like in his position Howell tries to retreat from society tries to exist as a hybrid in multiple spaces at once on all sides basically at the same time but ultimately this isn't possible you can't really be an outsider to war but when they come knocking it really has nothing to do with you this is the experience of everyone who's being drafted into a senseless war because it is not my war and it is like a weird kafka-esque almost un penetrable, weird con- conflict of a-, a layer that no individual involved will be able to understand. And you cannot exist between as a mediator or as an outside figure. Even Howell, who tries to be like a recluse in this castle outside of society, cannot be neutral. Mm. And the issue is, while you cannot be neutral, you can also not take sides. Because, holy shit, when you take sides, first of all, you become one of the killers on either side. And when you don't take sides and you just fight back against everyone, you become a monster as well. I think the war in this movie is really understood as a complete fact of the world that is cruel and senseless and really absurd. But it will be an influence and harm on your life and the world will be war-torn Yeah, in a, in a way. So, like, in my I, opinion, yeah. I, I actually think that, um, like... You asked the question, like, wh- whether or not uh, anything could, like, solve the war. Like, I would say that they're self-help. Like, they they helped uh, end the war by committing self-help on themselves uh, and, and thus, like, helping themselves grow out of the war. Like, it, it pairs up with the ending of uh, her finally kissing the prince. And... Uh, yeah, I think you're right, Tasso. I think that there's uh, this parallel that that really, you know, the the cause, the sort of um, the technical causes for the war are so opaque. But when the arcs of all of our, you know, protagonists are concluded and they have overcome their own internal conflicts, the external conflict is also solved. And I think that, you know, there is a, a commentary that, hey, maybe our propensity to just go to war with one another constantly has a lot more to do with an internal sickness rather than, uh, you know, a societal mm-hmm. one though. Uh, it's, it's nuanced. <laughs> also, if we right. get, if we get a bit too, maybe, maybe I'm getting too psychoanalytical here, but, uh, I do think this, this ties in quite a bit as well to like, uh, my reading that Howell heavily reflects Miyazaki. I agree. Particularly in the way that, um, yeah, he's like just constantly churned up by this like hatred for the war. 
and he like doesn't know what to do about it. He just like can't give it up, and he constantly like puts on this bravado and this kind of feeling that oh we we're gonna just cheer up and like it'll be fine. But he just is constantly kind of stewing on these things. Like he can't he can't tear himself away from it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, I also have to remark that by the ending, like how the war is solved in the movie. So, like talking about, I guess this ties a little bit into the structure of the movie, right? So, how the war is solved in the movie is like really, really suddenly and magical. And this is what critics have noted often some degree of dissatisfaction. Yeah, actually, with. I, I am not I, I, dissatisfied. I will actually add myself to that list. I honestly, I, I think, uh, I think, voice your uh, and and, and task your interpretations are kind of charitable. I, I personally found like the, the way that it like resolved the war and it turns out oh there, there's there's the prince and stuff. I didn't find it as satisfying. Um, th- there's this weird thing where uh, uh, Suleiman, uh, the like b- basically the Dick Cheney of the situation, yep. um, <laughs> um, just just a, a lot hotter. Um, <laughs> uh, just, Mommy uh, Cheney, as you say so. Just get gets a quick like look at at uh, at Heen the 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 spy dog turned pet of of the weird family uh, just like in the crystal ball and it's like oh well I she she, she just gives a shrug and says like oh let's just I, I suppose we'll just have to end the war now it's it's a, it's about time to be over I I, I don't right. really it does I don't think that it really ties into the personal narrative uh, narrative and I think it like. Uh, I, I I think what Miyazaki like I I think I, I might be reading too much into his politics, but I don't think that's honesty. I don't think that's Miyazaki being honest. I think that's him being really, really like, like wishful. Oh, oh, um, I, I need to fight for the other yeah. team here. I need to fight sure. for the other Sorry. team, Platon. Um, so my 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 very first viewing of this film has been a year, a couple of years, but I was sort of disappointed. I thought like, and I was trying to tie this in the bigger point about the structure of the movie. I thought of thought that yes, like the first half of the movie like is coherent, sticks together, and then at some point we kind of fall apart and things keep happening and everything falls over each other and so on. And to me. A, a, a remarkable point as to how to better approach and maybe better understand this film is less from the lexical or like plot centric perspective that but from what uh, Susan Napier proposes that Howl as a work is more poetic than narrative stringing together a tapestry of images to create a multifaceted whole creating a contradictory space that is both organic and mechanical one that evokes past permanency and tradition while at the same time, su- time suggesting speed change and fragmentation so to tie this into why th- read the ending a bit differently. In anime, you have a very common, I guess, stylistic device. And it is that the relations of the characters with the world and catastrophe in the world around them are tied deeply and married, basically, with the relationship of the central characters. Where, like, losing your girlfriend is, is uh, 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 synonymous with the end of the world. In anime, you have often like where deeply like world-changing conflicts are entirely mediated by like tiny interpersonal interactions. And this movie strikingly also has the structure. We have the focus on the little found family that finds itself and arranges itself and is torn apart by little conflicts and like outside influences. But as the family internally grows, the world changes around them. And that is, I think how we need to look at this ending rather than as a plot because I don't think Miyazaki would suggest that well you can solve war by just finding the prince of course not that's like that's not a political statement that's fairy tale right. logic yeah. but what I, does this the fairy tale logic tell us emotionally and that's what I really think is important because what the weird little family the found family the commune I want to say or in the moving castle is is instead of existing like divorced from the world is like this uh, reclusive space where um what's he called, where uh, 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 Howl can hide from the world and not participate, try to avoid conflict, and also not a Howl that goes out in rage to destroy the world. Instead, what we find is a community of mutual support, where together you can have your weird arrangement, you can reject the cruelties of the world, but you can live and support each other for your survival. Yeah. And Miyazaki suggests to us that not the literal kissing of the prince and waking up turn can change the world but a togetherness of this a sense of community like this can say, change the world and end the war not directly immediately in a plot sense but in the emotional like symbolic okay so, so I, I can see the logic of that and i completely agree that like house moving castle is a really like 
it, it, it's such a strange amalgam of like uh, a c- c- complete nonsense, like magical emotional logic, but what's by but still having like a really active plot filled with like ca- um, different characters with different agendas trying to accomplish things uh, and specific MacGuffins to s- solve specific problems. Uh, and so, so it is like structurally strange that way. Um, but I, but what 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 I don't really. I think the reason why I don't really appreciate the whole the war ending in that way um, is that it, it it doesn't feel as earned because like oh, oh yeah like it might be like just as fairy tale arbitrary as like Sophie's going back in time and seeing how as a as, as a young boy or like Calcifer returning just because uh, and or surviving having doused water on him just 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 because Sophie's like just nice and stuff. So, that that, so that, that stuff holds together a because it's fairy tale stuff and it's emotional yeah. logic, but I I I think um, I, I I think the war ending because of that sort of thing really I I think it un- honestly undermines the power of like the the war machine as part of the setting as part I, of the. I, I don't know I don't know I I want to I want to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, the question is: Do you think the regaining of Howell's heart is earned? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think so. Because I think, like, symbolically, the regaining of Howell's heart is the means of resisting yeah. the cruel world that Miyazaki suggests to us. And I think if mm-hmm. the earning of the heart is earned, that is the emotional arc that symbolically stops the end of the world. At, at least that's how I look at this, right? So if you're saying it doesn't feel earned, I guess in a plot sense, it, li- it literally doesn't feel earned. Like, because, of course, there has been nothing done to, like, actually talk about the war the reasons of the war but especially the fact that it's not about the reasons of the war but instead about you know having a heart and you know this scene where howell gets the heart and it's like yeah the the burden of a heart is heavy or whatever like i forget the quote yeah. the exact one but it's like heart, this heart crucial is a heavy, quote. heavy burden yeah. yep yeah exactly like the idea of caring about someone protecting someone ha- forming this community feeling empathy instead of being a recluse from the world that is the suggested way of engaging with a world that will inevitably have chaos, destruction, cruelty in it. And that's the survival. And I think yeah, but, but, but in exactly that, way, that it is very early. Exactly what you mentioned there, that like the world will inevitably have the this uh, this chaos to it. Uh, I I just I, I just think that's this um this, this shrugging th- thing, like they're, they're at the end uh, with no, the world no, just wait, sort no, I don't think it's ending. a shrug. I, I think I think that it's it's important that we see Miyazaki is making a statement that this war, the beginning of this war, the the initiation of this war, is arbitrary and senseless. And so too can its resolution be, if only, you know, uh, yeah, okay, okay, I can kind of see that people people sort of like have their you know values in the right place, right? Yeah, I I agree with Platon uh, mostly, where I feel like from a very functional and script writing perspective, the 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 war ending is kind of like. Uh, very wishy washy and very oh, quickly yeah. done. But yeah, I do really appreciate the life, the the line from uh, from Witch Cheney about um, <laughs> how she can just call in the pre- the the president and the, being, uh, and the defense minister yeah. and end it. Because essentially, that is how you end the war. Like especially talking about the war in Iraq that Miyazaki was specifically thinking about, where it's like they just went over there and invaded them. They could have pulled out any time. There was no like compelling thing where like America was going to get invaded tomorrow if they didn't stop. You know, it was like a total war that they had complete control over yeah. stopping. That's you know, right. spe- spe- yeah. speaking of that, like I, th- I think it's really interesting how House Moving Castle uh, kind of like, uh, of course, there's the Iraq War. Uh, so subtext and, and text with like the, the buffoonish uh, leader and the much more uh, cunning uh, second hand person and of course like the whole the, the time uh, he wrote it and why he wrote it like that but I, I think there's also some like World War One going on because unlike the Iraq War this doesn't seem to be like one huge uh, like I- empirical military might going like somewhere in the middle of nowhere to extract resources on some pretext it seems it it, it feels to also be influenced by like the whole uh, world war one meaningless list which was just right. war as a way of the world that everyone just shrugged and agreed was just something that happens sometimes and look at all these cool weapons we have and all these wizards we can use uh, mm-hmm. and and expecting it to be glorious when in reality it's like devastating um Absolutely. so, so I, I think that's a, that's an like 
I just wanted to bring that up because I, I saw a lot of like, you know, World War One type of like meaninglessness to it. Yeah. Because yeah, like there, even, was, even there were motivations behind the Iraq war. They were heavily dishonest uh, about it, but there was like a like reason why it happened. Well, I think you no. can't it's, help but realize that the black little magic helpers look like oil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, actually, there's an interesting, I mean, uh, there's a there was a decent um, paper that I read, uh, uh, the Wilson paper who, that, you know, likens the little, uh, you know, the Witch of the Wastes homunculi and also the um, the the transformed wizards, uh, you know, the, the military ones as being kind of like uh, kegare, right? Like these Japanese, you know, spirits of uh, of of impurity and uh, and how also uh, how also in his um, in 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 his tantrum his winged, his, winged form or no in in his tantrum oh. uh, when he his hair oh is when he ruined. summons the spirits of darkness because he's uh, he, yeah. Yeah, but I I I think that 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 is interesting. That it, it's like oil, right? That's this impure um, uh, substance. Substance, right? And but but also uh, almost um, yeah. It, it it's 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 valuable for for really bad reasons. Yeah. Essentially, no, I just wanted to point out that that like it. it it seems that like the the pretext and uh, and reasoning for 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 the war in House Moving Castle isn't like uh, extracting resources from a uh, much weaker a- enemy and like a lot of civilians dying in the process. Yeah. It's more the World War One thing of like war just being a thing you do sometimes. And now yeah. we have all these cool new toys yeah. to do it with. I, I think yeah. like the anger was of course directed at the Iraq War, but like. Miyazaki at this point does not seem to care what yeah. the reason is. Yeah. Right. It yeah. is just important that no, fuck that, no war. Yeah. And, uh, but, and but in also my opinion, like, that's, yeah. that, that's Go yeah. In, Go ahead. In my opinion, that, that is like part of like the rejection of like a bunch of um, fan, what do you call it, uh, fairy tale tropes that are brought up in the movie. Like, like the the war is essentially a B plot, at least like to me. Uh, like obviously she kisses uh, the prince in the end it doesn't like it's not really the main focus of the story uh despite her even being considered the lo- uh, his loved one by the curse that's put on him right. uh and like the the brave prince is like basically a coward all underneath yeah. oh yeah uh, side note here uh turnip turning into the, the like weird like yellow uh <laughs> The th- th- thingy prince is like the worst glow up since like a beast from Beauty and the Beast. Okay, <laughs> just putting that out there. <laughs> it's a downgrade, right? But like, think think about it. Like, she doesn't even break the curse that she's under. I think like she still has the gray hair at least. So and, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Is when well, I, th- I when think we'll get into the gray hair change, and Sophie's yeah. <laughs> uh, breaking the curse mm. thing. I think we'll get specifically right, okay, to yeah. that later. But um, you know, fair point. I think yeah, that the, stick the, with the, wall. <laughs> the transformation of Prince Justin from Turniphead into his, you know, human form and then going off to end the war. I, I think that there's, uh, you know, uh, aside, putting aside everything we've talked about and not necessarily trying to resolve that, uh, you know, maybe the the dissatisfaction of that ending, it being unearned. I, I do think that there is also a point that, uh, you know, Prince Justin is part of this found family, even though he is, you know, of an aristocratic class and uh or or you know uh a monarch and that there is need for you know people in power to you know feel connection and really like community with with you know the uh the common people and uh, and to and to care about them as if they are 
their own yeah. family. Yeah, we have this good, good um, point because, like, we have Howl in a castle, like castle. Of course, we think of feudal lords and kings being in their castles, but Howl's castle is a bit different. The castle literally runs away on its feet from society, mm -hmm. and Howl is in it. It's like dirty. It looks like a, a, a bachelor's apartment. Everything is dirty. Like the the dishes aren't washed. Garbage everywhere. <laughs> like the the two boys just living there in the filth, and, and until like the cleaning lady shows up, you know. Like we have this idea of him as, as like a vain recluse, like a hedonist who like mainly is known for stealing women's heart and all this. And he is excluded or reclusive from the world. I think one text brought up a loose connection to hikikomori being like a very big phenomenon right. in Japan at the time of the media, which is the basically a psychological condition of like reclusive mm -hmm. teenagers not leaving their room, not doing work or going to school and so on. That's like a psychological condition that was very prevalent in Japanese media at the time. The connection is somewhat loose, but I can see how Howell in, in some way is someone who's reclusive. Yeah, like and reclusiveness does not mean hikikomori. I, I think... Uh, I think that that's a stretch. This connection but, was made by the paper, not by me. Yeah, yeah but, but like I, 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 I will say, I disavow that uh, connection because I don't. Oh, no. I'll, 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 I'll sustain this connection Cal's because the uh, hikikomori, because he literally can't leave. Oh yeah, Cal's <laughs> the first. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, the connection is simply that it was a uh, that, it, that there's a time in society and in the Japanese mind on the news media and so on. There's a lot mm -hmm. of the idea that there are people who are uh, going. Uh, taking a re retrieve from the world by going away from the world, by participating in society. But this is a theme that Miyazaki had already brought up. Remember in episode two of this podcast, when we talked about Cast in the Sky and we, and we had this one common theme and how Miyazaki argued, talked about Cast in the Sky. He said, you can't live uh, 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 unattached from the ground. You have to live on the ground with other people. You cannot live in this floating castle. We have here a wandering castle, uh, but I want to say this is a very similar idea. Like we have Howl who is disconnected from this world and basically has no worldly care and is hedonistic and selfish and narcissistic and in love with his own like uh, 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 looks and so on. But by the end of it, Howl has a family. I find it significant to talk here also about how the castle from like the dirty place where he and the boy lived in and like it was like their, their fucking, uh, 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 you know, boarding house uh, 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 kitchen. Um, Man, at the okay. end, we have a nice little garden where the family hangs out in, right? Yeah, yeah that's a... That, mm -hmm. I, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get, get into like... The, I, I know the, we'll the, get there, but I'm yeah, making yeah, yeah. the point about yeah. how this ties into, you know, Howl's relationship to the war. But yeah, uh, clearly, uh, like one thing before we move specifically to Howl, because... Uh, like of of course we need to talk about him. He he's the title character and stuff. Um, I, I just wanted to mention another point I wanted to make uh, about like uh, the war uh, in, in this uh, uh, in this film. It's like the way in which like magic uh, becomes part of uh, of of the war. I I think is really really interesting because like magic is like inherently like unknowable, uh, driven by emotion and like it, it's 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 strange and it's freeing uh and and uh to for 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 this like industrialized nation to use that along with these like flying machines which might have some magic in their engines and stuff and and, and all these like magical creatures and, and wizards helping with the war effort uh like it, it kind of like uh has the subtext of like the world losing its magic because of this, like in, in industrialization and uh, nationalism, that, yeah. like, that like take take takes away. It it takes these like witches and wizards that live out there in in the wastes or in the swamps or or, or in their weird castles in between uh, places and dimensions, and turns them into like a resource, uh, a, 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 like bodies to be sent out. Uh, to war, and and I think that's why we have that whole losing your humanity thing with the yeah. with the wizards out there just becoming these tools, these monsters, instead of like the the craftspeople and like yes. the, uh, their connection with nature, uh, which uh, which is like a very a kind a very subtle uh, undercurrent of, of the movie. I think absolutely, this, this movie really does a lot to continue from Laputa, right? Because in Laputa, we also had the the tragedy of how technology and even the beautiful things constantly get turned into violence, mass destruction, and in ways to exclude yourself from the world and put yourself above the world. And you know, we will continue this theme throughout the rest of Miyazaki's films with The Wind Rises, obviously, uh, but. This, I, I really agree with this. And for Miyazaki, this is always tied into this, usually, 
Not always, but usually tie them to this deep mono alvare because you have to let the castle fly away. You cannot reach it. You have to let the airplanes, you know, sink and burn out. You have to have the other pilots like in Poco Rosso go. I think I just noticed this, but I'm, I'm gonna, just going to bring it up because it like, feels natural here. Like, what is the big mono alvare moment? I think this is one of the movies where we actually have it like yeah, uh, very little, right? Like we have no of the none of the sadness, but we have the magic fading, but we get it back by the no, end. No, no, right? there's, there's, there's one, optimistic. there's one moment of, uh, in the movie I will say is pure Mononoe Ware, but but like n- not not it's not a big moment of of course because that's not what Mononoe Ware is about. It's when uh, Sophie and Markel are eating their like lunch at the at, at Star Lake. Mm. Um, while in in on the horizon there are like thunderclouds, but like where they are, uh, it's sunny uh, and nice. And uh, and Turnip, the, the the best boy of the, of the movie, uh, is like doing the laundry and, and stuff. And they're just sitting there. And like in in any like many Taking other directors would like cut a, cut away after a few seconds for like, to like okay we we stay here for a beat and then we move on because like. We've established this emotional thing, so let's get the plot moving. Nope. The camera pans across the lake. And we just, like, take a look at, like, a, a mountain, like, I- in the distance. And the nice weather over there. And the Saishi score swells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, we, 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 we forgot to even mention Joe uh, Hisaishi doing some of his career's best work on this. The, the, right. the main theme of this movie is just amazing uh this this like both this wistful but also uh when, when play just right playful waltz that uh that that goes along with uh scenes between uh sophie and howl both uh but both both when they're like longing for something but also when they're just together and and feeling right it is so good mm. thanks for thanks for mentioning uh for mentioning Clayton. that I want to dovetail hey, yeah. off of your, you know, <laughs> comment about the, uh, you know, the how how the witches and wizards are being galvanized by this nationalist, you know, uh, uh, campaign to to become tools of war, and they're you know utilizing their magic to these destructive ends, and they're losing their humanity in the process, right? Well, I just I think that the the concept of magic in this is is very much symbolic of uh, not only technology, but really more of a more broadly, the spirit of creativity and ingenuity and artistic expression, uh, you know, of the human species. And that, you know, these, and I, 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 I want to bring it up because I think that that's essentially what Calcifer represents for Howell um and the way in which Howell's relationship with Cassifer you know uh starts out and then changes over the course of the film also has to deal with Howell's relationship to these uh to his own creativity and and artistic expression and ingenuity I think it has a lot of parallels to Miyazaki's own um uh ideas of, of his own artistic expression yeah that, that's that's a great way of looking at it and it also is something that uh, a, a theme that will come back with a vengeance uh, in the wind rises. Um, the whole like the, the the way the human spirit of creativity uh, gets corrupted, and, and like uh, for, for Miyazaki, you could say like flight and magic are like the same thing. Right. So yeah, uh, that, that, yeah. that's, that's a really great way of looking at it. Beautifully, the castle gets to fly by the end, and we get to live in the castle. I, I just to, right. you know, this is. Kind of striking to me. I, I, so Miyazaki has commented on this movie in hindsight that this is his favorite work and that he, he thinks this optimism was warranted. Which is funny because obviously, I, or maybe not obviously, but a lot of people, a lot of communities have very mixed feelings about how it's moving cars. So critics have had lots of criticism of it, but Miyazaki insists that's his favorite creation. And he says, I wanted to convey the message that life is worth living, and I don't think that changed. That's his quote to explain why this is his favorite movie he made. I, th- wow. I think that Roger Ebert gave it like two stars or something. Uh, like, two and a half, I yeah. think, yeah. Okay. yeah it, it's really weird, so but you'll like, never but see not, the, yeah. the top of anyone's list. It's like, a, this like might all be the others, favorite. maybe, but... <laughs> 
Yeah, I can definitely see it being a favorite though, because yeah, it, it has a such a distinct tone to it, and it's got so much going on. It's not, it's not really comparable to his other works in a lot of ways. Yeah, like it's just such a weird thing with Howls is like it's a lot of people's favorites. It's I, I think it's like personally, it might be on the bottom of my list of Miyazaki mm-hmm. works, but but like that, that's not that's not to diss the movie at all because right. uh, I, I I've, I've probably said this before because it's just how I feel about Miyazaki but there's, there was this quote from uh, Francis Ford Coppola when talking about the great uh, Akira Kurosawa uh, talking about like which are the greats uh, and he says well with with him uh, like it's not the question isn't like wh- which are the greats and which are the bad ones it's which are the greats and which are merely very very excellent so put yeah. Howl's Moving Castle down as merely very, very excellent I like in, in my book. I disagree yeah. wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Um, no, no, but, but I, I find that really interesting because like uh, as a, as Hipster uh, Cthulhu just said, like it, it, it's such such a unique thing uh, within Miyazaki's work. It does, It's not really comparable. Um, it's almost like, a it, it has more of a fairy tale logic to it than even Spirited Away. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and it like, and it has like a lot more like plot than most of his things, but at the same time, it just does, it, it couldn't give like, it, it, it just, just about goes where plot. it wants to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and I, 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 I honestly think like, um, House Movie Castle, uh, what it has going for it is its aesthetics, like, like fr- from characters to backgrounds to like just concepts to the score it's just yeah. sp- like spectacular in the way that it is like a spectacle it's just scene after scene of really creative stuff and really interesting th- and beautiful and odd and and evocative things uh, but but i it 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 it's just for me personally it doesn't really like um co- like come together to something bigger which which i find like the miyazaki's works often do but who knows maybe at the end of this discussion we'll uh, <laughs> we'll find something uh, to change my mind there right I, I think maybe one of the things that uh that fans of howl's moving castle love that don't do as much for me is actually howl um because that character has a lot of fans specifically like uh, people wanting to marry him Yes, <laughs> me too. The, the Dan Wynn Jones has has like uh, said in an interview that like uh that like e- even like just af- after the book was published, she got letters from uh girls wanting to marry Howl. Uh and the I mean after after this uh movie and, and like uh the um the line, to, uh, the, I think she said specifically that like the line for his hand in marriage would stretch stretch ac- across the world, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is a pretty good image. <laughs> yeah, I think I think part of it is that he's uh, that that sort of attraction is sort of two pronged, right? He, I mean, aesthetically, something that he cares a lot about, you know, in his vanity is is presenting himself in this very flamboyant, very suave and um, uh, almost uh, in, in the context of the, of the society in which he lives in the film, it's almost uh, purposefully like effeminate or, you know, androgynous, uh, mm. almost uh, like a, a very conscious rejection of the sort of aesthetic symbols of uh, masculinity yeah, the most obvious uh, example when uh, when he's introduced, it's in contrast with these like so- mustachioed soldier boys. That's right. Uh, like uh, the, not even flirting, just harassing Sophie. And he arrives and is just like he, he he's yeah like, like, like I say effeminate, um, but 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 also ha- has this confidence and grace and courtesy, he's which a dandy. is like immediately like, like <laughs> e- even if uh, it, like. Even I, like the straightest person I personally know, um, <laughs> I, I totally what get why. <laughs> I, to, I, to, I totally get why Sophie, uh, like, fell for him immediately. Uh, yeah, like that, that's, I mean, that, that's just like that, that's instant crush, right there. Like I mean, that I think that there's this, uh, you know, the the in the very first 
uh, scene in which we find Sophie and she's working in the hat shop. The, the, the other, uh, you know, the other women working in the hat shop who are just about to leave, they, they spot Howl's castle and they whisper among themselves, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Howl's nearby, you know, he's, uh, but he's famous for stealing girls' hearts, young girls' hearts, right? And then, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he, so it's this implication that he's a womanizer, uh, which I think very much uh, lands, even though we don't see him ever, you know, flirting with any other women or, uh, you know, he he does say later on that he pursued the Witch of the Waste when he once thought that she was beautiful. And then when he realized that she wasn't, he ran away. And then again, in that scene in which he sort of, uh, quote unquote, rescues Sophie from these uh, soldier boys, he, uh, what does he do with her? He takes her flying. And what is flying a metaphor for? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, like in Miyazaki's world, it's always like this deep, uh, romantic, uh, like often romantic connection. Intimate. It's almost believe Totoro fucked those kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Please, no. God damn it. <laughs> But seriously, there's a though. counter theory to told, uh, to to like the children are dead theory. <laughs> yeah, okay. The children aren't dead. Uh, it's I don't, something I don't, worse. I think we can say that doesn't count because Totoro didn't really fly. He more like jumped very high. And oh, then that, that, like, that's like, a the theory. So. so I mean, so did Superman so, until they had not, to not real, him. not real flying. So therefore, Totoro's <laughs> clean. Okay, uh, yeah. super take, jumping take is him a off different the watch list. Yeah. That's, no, but like, that's ob- funny. obviously, we can we can point back to uh, to Laputa. Uh, we can point back to uh, the, the the flashback scene uh, in in Porco Rosso with uh, uh, what what was her name? Uh, the romantic interest in, in that movie. What what the hell was her? Well, I'm blank. I'm blanking right now. Julia. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the scene in which you know Hal takes Sophie up yeah. into the air and flying, and and all of his all of his uh, you know dialogue to her or almost uh, his his statements to her is they, they can all be interpreted very you know uh, you know psychosexually. Like it's like oh stretch your legs, you know that's my <laughs> girl. You're doing great. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's, it's, also, it's the first thing they do when they meet. How always puts out on the first day. That's right. That's the, that's the kind of like the lover boy he is. Wow. That's right. And I mean, and but later yeah. on, you know, Sophie, she's she's very, uh, she doesn't think it counts essentially. But she's she's like ah, he didn't. That that wasn't anything special. If that had really been how, you know, uh, well, I mean, there's you know, there's no way it could have been how because he only likes pretty girls. Like he only goes after pretty girls. So it's getting into her insecurity at the beginning. Um, mm. but, but it's sort of this contrast, you know, Sophie is completely, you know, lacking in her, uh, in, 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 uh, excuse yeah, me, sorry. confidence and uh, in confidence yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and feeling, you know, feeling, uh, confidence in her appearance. Whereas, you know, Howl is extremely, um, Outgoing outwardly the, confident, outwardly flamboyant. Like yeah. he comes over, he immediately diffuses the situation with the two soldier boys. Immediately takes her by the arm and guides her. Like but, but, at that but, moment, but, we're but, like, oh, this guy also, knows. There's also danger to him. Don't forget oh, yeah. that because immediately you your fucking heart. The, the, these uh, those uh, you know goo, goo spirits. Just the uh, dementors <laughs> are after him. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, it's, so, so that's that element. He's being as well. stalked, right? He's being stalked yeah. by the witch of the waste. I mean, he's he's trouble because he's already broken so many hearts that he's like running away from stalkers as he's picking up another girl. <laughs> what a what a player! <laughs> but also gets him some mystique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. That that's, and and that's, that's the whole like uh, from from the whole like. Uh, I, I hesitate to say schoolgirl crush thing with him, but because like that sounds kind of dismiss- dismissive, but like, but 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 still, there's this whole thing with like him being kind of a monster, but but like but but like Sophie, uh, the, yeah, the audience surrogate is the Twilight. one that that can like get through his tough shell and like really like help him open up and redeem him, and that's like. That that's a t- very classic romantic fantasy. I mean, that, that's Twilight. Like, yeah, <laughs> Beauty and the Beast was going to be my example. <laughs> also, but yeah. Thank you. Fuck that Twilight. Is that what he's sparkling? Yeah. Um, yeah. Positively dashing. Yeah. I liked Edward when he became a lighthouse I keeper. I also like how we get that Howl uh, 
it's it's also kind of plays an opposite where like Howl is a uh, uh, Sophie starts off like in this kind of much more like mature or she kind of sees herself as mature for her age kind of role and Howl is this kind of like whimsical kind of a uh, pretty boy who's like so incredibly vain about like the color of his hair and like looking cool but then he slowly kind of like the war kind of drags him into having to accept a lot of these things yeah yeah and, and uh, while well, well, she think, turns uh, younger yeah yeah, and I think an interesting part of, like I said, uh, Hal being like Miyazaki is again not to, not to super psychoanalyze. It probably wasn't that intentional, but I just think it's funny that uh, in Susan Napier's book she references how there were several things around after Spirited Away came out. Miyazaki was like very unsure of his talents because a lot of people, like I don't know if it was critics or whoever, said that the marketing of Spirited Away was like really important in its success and like the Oscar push for it, and so like. Even like, I think it's like Miyazaki asked a staffer at Ghibli, you know, do you think the marketing was more important than my directing? And the, the staffer was kind of like, um, I, I, I don't know, like, oh, no. I don't know, boss. Yeah. And so Miyazaki just felt like very, uh, like, that's why this movie had, uh, Howl's had very little marketing in comparison. Yeah. And like Miyazaki didn't want to do interviews about it because he felt so unsure of his work. His pride and was it's wounded. Kind of like, I just think of Howl where he gets the hair color wrong and he's just so utterly distraught. He's like, <laughs> no, I need, I need, I need it all to like prove that uh, that I'm actually yeah. really cool. Oh, just a quick side <laughs> note: uh, it did get nominated for the uh, 78th uh, Academy Awards uh, for the year 2005, which is when it uh, had uh, had a premiere in uh, in America. Uh, it lost um, to uh, Wallace and Gromit's The Curse of the Were Rabbit. I mean that's that's pretty stiff, stiff competition to be honest. That movie's great. That, that yeah, movie's great. It, 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 is good. Uh, it, 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 there were only three nominations. The third one being uh, Tim Burton's Corpse Bride. Oh, so also, wow. also to be, to be is, controversial, is... I would definitely say worse. Uh, Curse of the Were Rabbit is uh, such an incredible feat of animation, much more so than. Owls in considering the amount of work and effort they had to put Listen, into it. Well, that, that, that's a kind of agrees. that may, means something, you know, considering Miyazaki the amount of work. Miyazaki kind of agrees, hmm. which is which is funny. Like yeah. the Howl's Moving Castle chapter had multiple interviews that Miyazaki conducted with like the people from who made Wallace and Gromit and like talking about Curse of the Were and so on. That is what we had in this <laughs> chapter. Him talking wow. about the movie that won instead. Like that's and amazing. Even, even to the me, point even of he stand of Curse yeah, of the Were Rabbit. He stand it also to the point where he was like, I want to have. Have a Wallace and Gromit exhibition in the Ghibli Museum. Wow! Oh my God. That and there makes was a lot like, of sense. Like a, a lot of the a lot of the crazy mechanical Rube Goldberg machines in Wallace and Gromit very much me stri- strike me as stuff Miyazaki would mark out for. So yeah, that doesn't and, even and surprise me. I don't know if it actually ever happened that there was the exhibition as part of the Ghibli Museum because at the time there was like a warehouse fire for like the production oh, company yeah, the, behind the, the, the warehouse yeah. burnt down and exactly. destroyed like tons of shit. It was crazy. And it was like, they weren't sure if they could even have enough shit to make a good mm. exhibition there at the, at the Ghibli Museum. So I haven't followed up on what happened after, but Miyazaki was getting ready to do it. <laughs> Let's just say this. He was very hype about it. Okay, that, okay. Uh, that was an amazing uh, little uh, side tangent there. Um, <laughs> we need to do the bonus episode on the first <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, we'll do a bonus episode of Wallace and Gromit if we get <laughs> enough patrons. <laughs> it's a stretch well goal. <laughs> I, I'm down. I'm fucking down. Yeah, okay. We Maybe need we'll movies even after see them in the Ghibli movie. Yeah, we need the, we need movies after the Ghibli movies are over. Like, yeah, who knows? Okay, but uh, yeah, Wallace and Gromit. Why the fuck not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can think of a few reasons, yeah, but, but let's uh, let's get back on track. Uh, we were talking about yes. parallels between. Uh, um, uh, I think hipster, you were talking about how uh, Howl's vanity was kind of a commentary on the whole like. Um, like a- advertising thing being more important than the core of it or something. Yeah. Hmm. Was that what you what what you were getting at? Oh, I'm missing. Yeah, I was kind of. I just thought that was an interesting parallel between yeah. because we see like Miyazaki go through a very kind of like a uh, small depression where he wasn't really sure of his work. Well, are you saying that Miyazaki too see, he saw himself as childish? Maybe maybe, the... a, maybe a bit. Maybe yeah, Miyazaki maybe he'll, he'll constantly sees it. himself as childish in some ways. Like yeah. he comments on this, like when he has well, a like weird we outbreaks. Well, like we say, he, he also positions himself very much like we say he's a lot like Porco. Yeah, and Porco constantly mm. like acting childish and mm-hmm. kind of running away from his yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess this brings us into a comparison that I wanted to make, which is to compare and contrast a little the transforming protagonists of Miyazaki movies, because we have multiple of them. We have Porco, of course, man to pig and 
back, maybe. Uh, we have Howl turning into the monster, and we also have Ashitaka uh, struggling with a curse as his arm is like gradually overtaking him. And Andrew Osmond also kind of picked up on these comparisons and had some things to say about it. And I guess this is also how I can tie Howl again into the war. Because Andrew Osmond states as much as that uh, Howell's pure-hearted anti-war stance is presented as nihilism with no alternative as he fights forces from each side and becomes the worst terror of all. And he compares this kind of to Ashitaka, who instead of, like I'd say, becoming a terror on the world and fighting both sides, both sides, is fighting the curse within him to negotiate a peace between both sides. So we have like a... Uh, 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 interestingly enough, like a similar like character cast into these situations, not similar character in terms of personality, not at all. They couldn't be more different from each other, but as in role and function of the story. And what Howl does is lashing out, destroying, mm-hmm. reaching out, and his anti-war, his hatred for war goes so so deep that it's complete nihilism. Like you can't right. be so against war that all you do is kill everyone who kills people, right? Like that is that turns him into the monster. Whereas Ashitaka defeats the curse in himself by negotiating this peace. Yeah. And I guess when we talk about the transforming, I can only see that like Marco as Porco is also a hedonist who lives on a secluded island, just like, you know, and a womanizer, just like uh, uh, Howell lives in his secluded castle, uh, uh, a womanizer, hedonist uh, outside of the world, trying to dissociate himself from it. And, you know, this motif's, mo- motif keeps recurring and Osmond states that this points out to a theme recurring in Miyazaki's work which is the limits of masculinity this is the words uh, 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 Osmond chooses and I find Mm -hmm. them to be interesting because all of these different approaches um, show kind of where where they fail like the the disaffected stance of Howell failed because he turns into a worse monster than he could have been Uh, we we of course have talked about Pocoroso and why the transformation possible transformation back in a human had to occur but here yeah this is uh, i guess a recurring motif in miyazaki's work that i really appreciate here as well yeah absolutely um i think that uh you know that that childishness is very central to howell's character and that that is very much tied into uh the conception of you know uh, hegemonic masculinity being very um under immature and underdeveloped, you know, the emotional intelligence of, uh, of this, you know, uh, masculinity as it's presented by Miyazaki in his films is, um, extremely, uh, you know, lacking in the ability to, to form, you know, uh, yeah. healthy emotional yeah, yeah, connections. Yeah, yeah. You, you have this direct, actually, like, like direct line that it's it's the heart of a child he has, mm-hmm. uh, because specifically because he lost his heart as a, as a child, um, and and yeah. it, and it creates this really interesting dynamic with uh, with Sophie, where like she's very uh, she she has to be very maternal to him, especially at this. Uh, Near, near the like the, the middle of the movie, yeah, uh, where like he he he's just like out all day, and he comes back and makes a mess of everything, and uh, mm-hmm. and and just takes a bath and goes to his room, you know that that kind of like petulance, and, um, and even his room is super like messy. like a spoiled brat, yeah, 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 like it's it's like a spoiled brat's room with like all these pretty little yeah, yeah, garments, yeah, yeah. And, too. And, yeah, and, she, and she takes and care of him, like, like she, she has to like uh, like. T- shruggingly like t- take care of him when, when he has his like tantrum summoning the dark spirits well at, at first like him. she goes out like at, at first that's just too much for her and she she goes out yeah. has a mm-hmm. little cry then like she gets her shit together because she has to because she has taken on this responsibility for him which is like yeah mm-hmm. which is where, where like sophie like is like really again maternal and motherly and where she's like most at home, I think, in in the body of of uh, an old lady, but yeah. as um, but but as they come on more equal footing, uh, and and she has to to like be, uh, like have a heart to heart with him, or he like whisks her away, uh, in 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 some way and shows affection for her. That's when like she embodies this younger. Uh, uh, body, which which I, f- I find to be a really interesting dynamic. Also, like w- when we think about like the comparison to Beauty and the Beast, which I've made a couple of times, I'm thinking like specifically about the relationship in in the Disney version, hmm. where you also have this 
thing where like the the main girl is like begrudgingly maternal and like kind of has to take on this responsibility because they see this potential in this person to be better to to live in a better way Mm. and and have a home with them uh and uh, and once that character like uh that that love interest get like gets that and, and improves and and, and and sees like eye to eye with them. That's when the romance truly blossoms, and that's when the monstrousness gets like uh, uh, torn away. But at the yeah, same that, time, at the same time, I think that there's some something really fun going on with um, with Sophie also having this uh, weird transformation going on, where it's kind of a reverse yeah. of the of the Beauty and the Beast. We should, yeah, we should get into that later about with, how with Sophie. seeing her beauty and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think really but, to, but to cap off the 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 Osmond argument is yeah, yeah, that yeah, Osmond too. ultimately and and you also said it like in a in a, in a, in a very nice way, but just to the, finish it off with a quote, I guess, is that masculinity in this film is portrayed as both nobly idealist and incorrigibly childish, except mm. when redeemed by love. So the theme of responsibility you stated, Platon, I think, is really significant. Because in the end of Poco Rosso, Marco has to take the responsibility of finally asking Gina out. And then, you Gina, know, taking the Thank future you. that comes <laughs> Gina, yeah. Finally got in the end Man, of it. Howl, uh, in the end of it, Howl adds a little garden for the family he now has to the castle. It is now responsibility he takes on. Like all this like idealistic part of masculinity is redeemed by not having him be this like reclusive nihilist but instead someone who takes responsibility for the people the community forms i don't want to say like strictly just family but very importantly found family yeah because yeah. what redeems him is not like uh, uh like like in beauty and the beast like the love to a young woman but an old woman who he comes to care about because she is so responsible and caretaking. Okay. Yeah, well, this, I think, we'll, we'll, we'll be get a really to the... significant inversion. I, I know we get yeah, to yeah. Sophie, but like, this is important for Howl as well. Yes. Because what, what, what he can see, and Miyazaki says this as well, it is not that uh, Sophie has suddenly become young, but that she forgot her age. That's right. That is a quote. And that's what I find significant here. Howl as well forgot her age because he came to care about her, not for the surface level reasons, but for this deep caring and responsibility taking that he can learn from. So mm. I want to get into that. Uh, how how did how did Howell end up being so childish? Well, you know, his his heart was given to Calcifer. And I think that that was a bid for independence, a bid for freedom. Uh, a, you know, that's it's it's his pact, his almost Faustian pact to to be special, to be apart from the world, to be uh uh, to use his creativity in ways that are, you know, unhindered by, uh, you know, how society or his, you know, his parental figure, for example, yeah. uh, Madame yeah, Solomon, as, as, wants as, as to we control him. The, um, yeah, we, we, as, as, as we learn during the course of the movie, uh, he, uh, he, 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 he swallowed this star, which was like him making this contract with the, with the demon Calcifer. Uh, during his uh, his tutelage under uh, Suli, uh, Suleiman, who mentions that like he uh, is like the most talented wizard she's ever like uh, taught, uh, and, and like could be like the successor to her. He's he, he's that good, but there's also this element where like he has this contract that's binding him to the kingdom, where where, right. where like because he studied under the, the sorcery academy. That means that that he has to answer to the king, so I so I think you're you're right on the money there that it was a bid for freedom because he was actually like under this there was all all these expectations and a literal like binding contract over him, right. which obviously doesn't gel with his like freedom uh, seeking nature. But it's this. But it's the this. binding contract is also really well uh, like portrayed really greatly vi- like visually in that like um it's a like, you board. know that he can't. Well, yeah, yeah, it's on the dartboard. It has a million fucking knives in it, <laughs> but the knives are not—they're not touching the text, and that just shows you how much value, like, like he cannot get rid of this oath, right? Basically, the and, um, you know, his his bid for freedom and his his contract with with Calcifer, it's not a, uh, it's not a very carefully thought out plan. It's very much youthful recklessness and rebellion, and and he's still stuck in that mode throughout 
his life until Sophie enters the picture. He's still, and 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 because he only knows how to sort of rebel against authority rather than truly like stepping away and, and creating his own independence, right? That's why he is still attached to this conflict and and uh, and and feels like he has to be part of the war. Um, and and it's also why he can't he can't grow up on his own. And he's his his heart is in a state of arrested development. Right. Yeah. His emotional intelligence. His heart, his heart is literally encased in this castle, if we want, right? Because right. Calcifer is his heart in this castle. Cannot really leave the castle until like later on when we can kind of see this sort of more independence in Newcastle. But like I find it such a like symbolically like powerful thing that like Howl's heart is encased in the castle mm -hmm. this like entire reclusiveness his freedom comes at the cost of like living divorced from society in this way always needing to feed the flame uh, which is also quite suggestive and by the end <laughs> like the castle falling apart somehow also marks Howell's liberation from being enclosed in this castle by now having people bonds to share this space with yeah it's this and sort of Calcifer ego being death. just one of them yeah and Cal Calcifer itself also has this weird dynamic with the castle of like it actually also wants to be a free spirit um but has questions about what will happen if it changes um like will it die uh, yeah. remain the same person is there even a life uh, for this home if i choose to leave uh and like of course at the end it rely it goes out of relying on Howl's heart yeah. and along with the house grows into a flying house, and like we mentioned earlier, and essentially unlocks new potential through carrying, like through carrying this change with him, yeah. uh, and not Definitely. abandoning. Definitely, the, past. the ma I mean, the 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 castle itself. It's it's both uh, an escape for Howl from society, and also the you know the the mask or the high walls. I mean, it literally has a face, right? It is a mask. And it's also these high mm. walls, this this defense mechanism for the fragile, you know, vulnerable heart that that Howl has, and which which is, you know, given to Calcifer, this the, the heart of this castle. I wanna share a quote from uh from Rudd in his article, um the uh the, the building castles in the air, deconstruction in, in Howell's moving castle, uh, which talks about, um, it's mo this article is mostly about the book, but this quote applies also to the movie, I think. He, he talks about the castle itself. He says, Howell's is a moving castle, but one itself moved by those experiencing hardship, those on the road. It is therefore ironic that Howl is initially feared as an utterly cold-blooded and heartless wizard. Though technically true, he is heartless only because he has given his heart to Calcifer. So it is the latter who sees into the hearts of others and vets them. Vets them for allowing them entry into the castle, right? Because it's Calcifer who lets Sophie in. And yeah, yeah. After, you know, so Sophie, <laughs> I love this moment of characterization when she has first gone into the wastes to try to find a, a cure for her curse and she meets Turnip Head and to get Turnip Head to leave her alone, she says, you know, go find me a place to stay. And Turnip Head almost intuitively goes and finds Howl's castle because there's something about Howl's castle that is explicitly the heart of Howl in the care of Calcifer that is seeking out uh, people who are lost, people who are downtrodden and wants to care for them because that is the person that Howl is at his core. He's a compassionate person, uh, yeah. someone who, who, who cares deeply and has lots of empathy for, for individuals and also for humanity as a whole, right? Yeah, uh, he's just like really he just makes a huge effort of like hiding it with all these affectations and and, and lash and and using yeah. it as an excuse mm -hmm. to lash out at, at what he dislikes about suffering instead of like empathizing with the suffering it's really, yeah, really I think a that heavy that's, burden. Espe that's especially shown very well in the way the magic functions in the film particularly with like how uh, howl and calcifer's relationship being kind of like 
self-destructive in how it's set up because calcifer is like bound by contract to hell to give him power to the point where he's almost kind of like a slave like it's portrayed quite comedically calcifer's like unwillingness Mm. to do stuff but you know there is kind of this he had just has to do what hal says (laughs) and he gives him immense power but i think it's really interesting to note that uh we see the idea that uh calcifer's power is just eating away at Hal, and it's slowly making him more and more of a monster, and it's slowly hurting him and transforming him. But I think it's also important to note that this only happens when he does these kind of like, I guess, you know, like evil magic, when he like turns into a beast and needs to fight. Like there's the scene where he um he downs the aircraft that's flying over the field of flowers, and he like part of his arm becomes monstrous. Yeah. Or like in these other parts, because he's using this magic, this kind of like part of himself and his own heart and his own empathy. And he's like using it to do like harm and to yeah, hurt people because he's so like angry at the world. But we see the other scene where he transforms the house into a new house on the inside and it's all lovely. And he doesn't look any worse for it. He looks like fine. Like he's done something for other people, for this uh, adopted family, like this other big magical feat. Yeah. But it's like made, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, almost um, made him more energetic. Like he looks better for it. So it's kind of the way that magic really functions as this kind of like um yeah it basically is kind of his empathy and his imagination yeah that's the and great... all these things we associate with with it and you can rather burn it away with anger and with like hate at the world or you can like use it for the people around you you can turn it towards something good wonderful observation yeah, yeah I, I, I think like uh, what you get out of with calcifer is really interesting because like it kind of feels like calcifer is also in some weird arrest development because Calcifer mm-hmm. is like, I I believe the most powerful character in like mm. may, maybe Suleimani uh, Suleiman is more powerful, but like he he like everyone's like oh shit that's that's the fire demon that thing is powerful that thing can break your curse it can do whatever the fuck yep but he's like yeah. I can break your curse no problem yeah Just, exactly you know, break no my problem. curse first yeah yeah, yeah. But, but but the thing with, with but Calcifer is also like a co- comic relief type of like immature uh, little thingy that that's like bound to the castle in a way that it feels like a mascot them. character like a donkey yeah. in shrek or something. yeah well he, he's quick he, he, I mean, he great, is this, he's great, this great spirit of creativity you know in, in, in yeah. his language and the way he expresses himself through words like he's very quick-witted and and quippy and you know uh, constantly making these vulgar vocalizations you know at people uh, it's very much a uh sort of this unbridled uh way of expressing oneself yeah uh, can we also just real quick uh once again mention how amazing the animation in this movie is because calcifer mm. just just the idea of like okay this character is literally a fire so <laughs> have fun with that is fire yeah you can yeah do it. I, I just so love the, every little it. detail with how uh how calcifer moves between <laughs> places it, it can it can be and like uh and like how he, he like consumes yeah. and eats things. And or like the fire is dying and he like clings to yeah, the little wooden, wooden so block. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or where it's raining yeah. outside and he's like trying to avoid the rain. He covers yeah. his head. I love how he <laughs> almost stick. died. Yeah, he, he, he almost dies a lot actually. Yeah. <laughs> he gets almost killed all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and actually that's like, a good uh-huh, point. Yeah. I want to I wanna I wanna focus on that. He he does almost get killed a lot. And you remember what I said earlier about how, you know, magic and also, you know, this the 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 fire the fire and the and the stars and the fire demons and and you know the and the shooting star that Howl catches are all these spirits of creativity and artistic expression and ingenuity and engineering. The fact that Howl almost dies several times in the movie is this threat of losing that ingenuity and losing that core expression of you know, the human experience. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting is how Calcifer, by being uh, in, in this contract and by being bound to this castle, is like disempowered uh, in, in, a, in a big way, like l- limited and like has all these chores uh, he has to do. There's even like a, a really cool uh, d- design detail where if um, th- there are a few like bigger shots of like the fireplace and it has the same design as like the mouth on the outside of the castle. Like mm-hmm. he is within some kind of mouth. He he is also mm. like 
he is eaten, you know, he was eaten and he's still like, yeah. Um, and I, I, I <laughs> nice. think that's really interesting that this powerful character is limited in that way. And then at the end of the film decides to return to that. Yeah. Because like being limited, having this body, like, like the castle is Calcifer's body, you can say. And now someone to protect in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, well, like well, it, it I think grounds it was, him and connects him with these characters, it, even as it, it makes him clear, vulnerable. He was he was always trying to break his contract. But a, a, a thing that he also brings up is he is kind of like also trying to save Howl because he knows that Howl is being slowly torn and eaten up by this contract as well. Yeah. So it's very clear that he also like does care for him. And even yeah. though he kind of is his slave, he kind of has realized that like they depend on each other. Because yeah, I mean, again, as like we say, they are essentially two halves of the same kind of character, right. the same heart. They're intimately also, connected. Also, obviously, the whole visual metaphor in um, we see Calcifer in a big, almost like embering out in a big pile of uh, like ash, the fireplace and uh, thus Hal's heart have not been taken care of properly yeah, for a long yeah, time. Yeah. And mm. Sophie's got to come in and clean it all mm. and get it nice and get it running functional. Because yeah. that's what she does to Hal. And and I think, it, it's so good the visual, like like the, the the metaphors, but but I think we'll get deep into that when we discuss the whole found family uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, and I I think that uh, you know when when they reconstruct the when they reconstruct the castle at the very end, I one thing that I want to point out is the hearth where where you know Calcifer is, uh, though Calcifer no longer actually has, you know. Um, Hal's heart anymore but the hearth is exposed to the outside world it's on this mm, external mm. patio it's no longer hidden within within these closed walls it's on mm. the outside it's exposed to the elements it's it's somewhat vulnerable but at the same time there's there is warmth and there's community uh to that vulnerability that, that, that's a great blink and you'll miss it detail that mm, has yeah. such a significance actually that's interesting um, before we move on to something else, uh, I just want to mention like the magic in this movie is exactly how I always want, imagine like magic and spells should <laughs> be. Like whenever anyone in this movie casts a spell, it just feels exactly right. Like, 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 yeah, that, that's that's how a curse is bestowed upon someone. Or oh yeah, that that that, that little um, that little paper slip that uh that sophie accidentally sneaks in and like makes a scorch mark the way that is animated and function is just like i mean yeah of course that's how you mark someone and and a place it's so good and and like very true magic uh, yeah the magic feels like exactly right it's so good yeah it's evocative it's primal yeah and so, it's also like left mysterious enough that like gives the audience like something to grasp, but yet kind of still like be in awe of. Yeah, like, uh, like you understand how like when uh, Suleiman uh, conjures this whole ocean and like tries to like uh, reveal Hal's true form, that that's what's going on. Um, and and Hal like so escapes from it through the ceiling because it was kind of an illusion. It it, yes. it kind of like it has this way of making sense while also being completely mm. baffling and mysterious, and you understand that these are master wizards and witches fighting in ways we can't really okay. see. Mm. You know, so the for, curse. For further reference, everyone watch Mr. B Tongue's video on magic. Uh, link that in the description. Cool. Uh, I think it sums up. Remind me in text. <laughs> the, so I want to talk about the the way that curses work in this film. Okay, hold on. One thing before I still have one thing for Calcifer, then oh, yeah. we can like because I think we're leaving Calcifer behind a little yeah. bit now. Well, and I just sure. one scene sticks out to me, which is Calcifer is like, I need something from you, Sophie, to eat. And like Sophie's hair is what he's then then he eats. Like burns it off and like eats the whole fucking ponytail thing, the the braid. That stuck out to me. Like I, I, watching it, I was like, okay, let me put down this as a note. What does it mean? And I think voice I like, like you quoted this text and I talked about like how Kelsofa kind of vets the people coming in and like mm-hmm. takes a part of them in as as like a thing. Like, do you think this is like, or, or, or to all of you, it, this is like the whole of the read here from Kelsofa's side that it's just like this idea of, you know, taking someone in to, I guess, fuel the fire. Or is there like maybe more from Sophie's side, of course, like cutting the hair always signifies character change. And we can talk about mm-hmm. that when we get to Sophie. But like from Calcifer's side, what do you like? 
Have you got any good takes on this? I, I think it's just a neat little uh, detail where, where, where like, like it's part of the magical rules. Because Calcifer got disconnected from the castle, that kind of also broke his connection with uh, with Hal, which was what gave him power. So he has to have a connection to someone else. And that that becomes his connection. Uh, I remember, like, doesn't he like ask for her eyes first? Like, yes, maybe eyes. Your eyes? Yeah. Could, you, could you hand me those? And so, like, uh, so how about this? It's also, it's also. I think it's symbolic of almost uh, a marriage because Calcifer is is entering part of Sophie into the pact that he has with Howell. Mm. Now her hair has combined with Howell's heart as the fuel for Calcifer, right? So it's them together now, right? And so together, those two characters, Howell and Sophie, their their combined, you know, effort or energy or essence allows uh, Calcifer to to do things that he was never able to do before just with Howell, right? He can he can leave the castle and then he can form a new castle um, even without Howell's presence there. So I think it's definitely, hey... You know, I'm the arbiter of Howell's heart, and you are somebody that has reached into his heart, and now it's time for you to truly connect to his heart. Mm. Uh, I also think the um, the visual metaphor works really well well for it, like with the the hair colors, because we also see um, yeah with Howell's hair color. As well, over the course of the movie, he he starts out with this um, <clears throat> bright blonde and like piercingly like bright blue eyes, and as we said, he's like this transforming hero. And over the course, by the end of the movie, he's back to how he kind of was as a boy with his dark mm-hmm. hair and darker eye colors. And also, the uh, the dark hair is also the same kind of color as his weird crow man evil form. That's like you know, Crow kind man of evil that, form. Yeah. yeah, whatever, whatever we're calling that. Like, which I think also we tied into the the masculinity thing, where it's yeah. like this kind of part of him that can only really now exist yeah. because there's love there. I, so I, will, I, will, I will, I will, and then of course well. Sophie's hair yeah. color is the the starlight. It's kind of the, yes. the not gray, but it's yeah. not back to her old way. It's this new bright shining mix of both. Uh, could, could, could we could we uh, could we, de- could we de- declare that his like winged form would be like his. Uh, his war plumage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, was yeah. this also a tokusatsu movie? Because he henshins into his uh, <laughs> oh, superhero yeah. form. Because uh, he is Batman, as like we said. He's, he's doing... No, so, yeah, no, no. Actually, it, 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 is a, it, it is a mecha uh, anim- anime. Yeah, obviously. It's, it's a mecha anime. <laughs> That's... <laughs> but of, of course, like all tokusatsu, it also has mecha in it, you know. Get in ah, the castle, Calcifer. <laughs> so I think there's I think there's an interesting I think no, there's no. an important scene that we can't that we shouldn't gloss over when it comes oh, to yeah, Howell yeah. and his relationship to his curse is the scene it's the dream sequence so after <clears throat> Sophie has come back from Solomon um uh and flown the you know plane yeah, the or whatever into thing, the yeah. face of, of of the castle and she's asleep on you know just a, a little mattress pad on the floor and. Howl comes in after having, you know, essentially like tried to, uh, to, 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 to protect them by leading the other, you know, the, the Solomon's henchmen away. And he comes back and he's like dripping in blood and feathers that are falling off of him. He's molting and he's, he, he climbs up the stairs and, and Sophie gets up. And, uh, at first there's this dream sequence, right? Where she gets up and she's no longer afflicted by the curse, which is why I think it signifies that there it's it's a dream and it's not reality. Because if it were reality, she would either be an old woman or she would be, you know, in one of her various ages, but with gray or silver hair. So she goes upstairs to after Howl to look into him. And there's this, she goes through this cave um, that is covered in all of these childish artifacts. Right. And at the end of the cave, Howl in his monstrous form, actually not the monstrous form we see elsewhere in the movie, because elsewhere in the movie, even when he's fully transformed, his face is always. uh, At least when he's in front of Sophie, his face is always human. Right. But in this cave, he's completely monstrous. His face is, you know, this this weird sort of harpy esque, um, you know, 
uh, creature. Uh, you got and big nasty teeth. Big nasty teeth. And, yeah. you know, she says, Howl, you know, I want to help you. And Howl's response is, you can't even break your own curse. You know, it's too late for me. You can't even break your own curse. And then she responds, but Howl, I love you. And then Howl, you know, uh, flies away. And I think that this uh, scene is is so important to illustrating, you know, how Sophie is trying to reach Howl and also the way that Howl views himself. He's under a curse of his own making because he is turning to this, you know, turning to this nihilism and to violence and to hatred. And, you know, uh, he he's probably too prideful and also too vulnerable to ask for Sophie's help, especially when he sees her as somebody who's also struggling. I think this sort of... Mm, I think the movie has a lot to uh, to say about you know, in in a relationship, in a healthy relationship, that it's it's not necessary that both parties are you know of perfectly sound mind. That that's not the way the world really works. Um, everybody has their own problems. Everybody has you know dysfunction, and uh, it's it's through trying to mutually support each other rather than keeping each other at arm's distance, right? Because Howell wants to protect Sophie, but he does so by running away from her, right? He, I, I think it's so important that after this scene, when, when, um, when he forms the new, the new uh, or when he merges the castle with the hat shop and then takes her to the flower field and Sophie realizes, oh, he's planning to go away. And uh, it's it's when the bombing finally starts happening and he stops the bomb and, and enters into the house with Sophie or escorts her there. And he says to her, you know, I, I'm not running away anymore. I finally found something that I want to protect. But I, it's this, it's almost that he is tricking himself because he has somebody to care about besides himself now or that he truly feels a connection to somebody. He's almost creating, uh, he's, he's making Sophie at that point a, 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 an like excuse a sublime for his object. out at the world. Exactly. Mm. It, it, it becomes an excuse for then participating. And he's, you know, it's, it's this justification that, oh, now I can truly be righteous in my, uh, in my, in my yeah uh, war against everything exactly in my war against everything because there's this pure person who loves me and I need to protect them and so yeah, but, but that, yeah, realizes like he, he 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 he's like possessive about it it's like his feelings uh, exactly while, while mm -hmm. Sophie has her own like deep feelings about wanting him to be safe which he like kind of disregards to be with her yeah they and, she and, wants and, and, she wants a yeah. partnership not to be not to protect him but to be with him. I, I guess. I guess here I want to. I, I want to take this. What you just brought up, beautiful point, and contrast it to a different scene where we see Sophie uh, uh, acting, and maybe taking a bit ahead because we're going to get later into more about Sophie and the uh, the Witch of the Waste. But in a very pivotal moment, the Witch of the Waste, still like somewhat possessed by her greed for like Howl's heart, grabs yes. Calcifer out of those uh, out of the house and uh, starts burning. Without thinking, Sophie takes a bucket of water and extinguishes her because even though the, the Witch of the Waste has done her very wrong in the past, hearts can change and that's kind of like Sophie's central approach. Without thinking, she even risks the life of Calcifer at that moment just to save, in quotation marks, an enemy, someone who done uh, has done something wrong. And right. this is like the core thesis of Sophie's caringness versus, mm. you know, Howl's excuse to protect people while, while actually just lashing out. That it's much harder to have this compassion and empathy even towards your, in quotation marks, enemy, because of course at that point the Witch of the Ways is a lovely old lady that is only like has a shadow of what she used to be still lingering when she stares into the flame. Yes. But this is, you know, also like symbolically, of course, and this extinguishing of Howl's heart, like literally and figuratively. And that's like a very poetic moment. 
in that sense, yeah. and contrasted yeah. to what you said, voice. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I, I think this is also like a good way to, to like get get into the the themes of inner and outer beauty and transformation, because yeah. that's like that that's very central to this relationship dynamic. Both of them, uh, like mentioned before, uh, both Sophie and Hal have this thing where they transform uh based on their where their heart is and uh and 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 their relationship to each other uh in a way and and it's it's really like it's it's really interesting how uh howell's childishness is tied in a way to his vanity uh mm -hmm. like maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm i'm wrong here it's just kind of a, a thought um because we, we, he has this temper tantrum thing where he summons the dark spirits <laughs> and becomes goo. Uh, and, and there's this wonderful little uh, throwaway line where uh, Markle, uh, the apprentice, this kid is like, oh, no, he, he's summoning the dark spirits. I saw him do this once when he got dumped. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> like, it's and, not and, a serious Sophie, thing. And then Sophie yeah. responds, you know, she's she's had enough. And she says, I've never once been beautiful in my life. Yeah, because what he's what he's tantruming about is like how can he says like literally like how I don't see the reason a point in living if I can't be beautiful, which is She's like a really really granted. incredibly vain line, and I, I'm not sh insensitive completely, and yeah. and that gets me I think uh, if we can pivot into talking about Sophie and her curse and the way it works yeah. and sort of her character arc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's central to the theme of beauty. Yeah. yeah. So I want to I want to talk about what her state is at the beginning of the movie prior to any magical involvement uh, and, and prior to her curse, because there is a detail that is very easy to miss. And that is that Sophie is grieving the loss of her father, the passing of her father. She right, has like this, he, he he owned the the hat shop and she's ta the hat just shop. taken over from him yeah he, she, she's she's taken over from him but you can tell that uh she is uniquely still attached to his memory and probably because she is a very responsible person right she feels like as the eldest it's her responsibility to carry on um and upkeeping the 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 hat shop, oh, even yeah. the, you know Letty when she goes to visit Letty when Let when they go outside Letty asks her, you know, you know Sophie, do you want to stay working in that hat shop all your life? Uh, and and Sophie says, well, you know, it's what father would have wanted, and after all, I'm the eldest. And then Letty isn't says, "Isn't that literally not... the opening line of the novel? It, it isn't easy to be the eldest of three, or something That's like that." That's correct. In the novel, yeah. it's very much more central, but in the in the film, it's almost a toss away line. Yeah. Um. But but this is, you know, I think this this sense of attachment and responsibility for carrying on, uh, uh, her father's uh, will, as a, as a sense of attachment to him and not having fully grieved him. It's. It's even more, uh, she feels even more responsible because her sister and even her mother, his, her father's husband or her father's wife, uh, have already clearly moved on, right? Letty is independent. She's working in her own job now. Also, both her mother and Letty are these, uh, they're women who are adhering to, you know, patriarchal ideals of femininity yeah they're, right? they're dolled up yeah they're dolled up you could almost say they were literally like, identical yeah yeah <laughs> the mother very like this insane like hat with this like weird bird oh, yeah. on it like it's, it's actually it's, it's actually garish. kind of kind of confusing how close their character designs are to each other i, I was confused I whether they were the same character the for, for my but first they're very games. different characters because letty obviously has compassion and concern for for Sophie, I mean, she's encouraging her to to pursue her own dreams and, and or to even just think about what her own desires are, because at the beginning of the movie, Sophie has completely muted her her sense of self. She's she's allowed her you know uh, her duty to her father to you know subsume shop, all of her own yeah. desires. There's this great shot, and shout out to you know Will the Dill because his comments on Violet Evergarden and, and, and trains in that anime 
made me realize the the scene when Sophie leaves um, uh, leaves Letty's shop and takes the tram home. Right, she's riding the tram. She's looking off into the distance, and she's on this mechanical apparatus that is disconnected from the ground. Right, she's detached from the society around her. She is, uh, and 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 this is the state that she's in. This she she is depressed. She feels that she doesn't measure up as uh, to her sister or her mother in terms of her, you know, femininity. Like when she first goes out to see Letty, she tries on one of the fancier hats, and she uh, she tries it on. She she's like she does a little pose, a little smile for the mirror, and then she feels that you know she 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 tosses it aside in a huff and puts on her own plain you know practical uh straw hat yeah unadorned really, really a woman after my own heart standing <laughs> one piece throughout the the whole movie it's a, it's, it's, it's one that a... you... But at first, Even she's insecure up, about it, right? She's yeah, it's, it's, really it's a great like bit of performance, shot, that, like that, animation wise. Like, like it, that, you get a lot of like her personality, her insecurities, her reservedness, it, j- just from the way she like moves. Like the vo- voice acting, of course, that does uh, that does does a great deal. But st- but still, like it's such a such a reserved character who's not v- that expressive, and they still manage to, to like convey all this. Um, yeah, the yeah, whole early yeah. part of the movie gets so much about Sophie established. It's amazing, and yeah, it just is. that little shot that's like two seconds long of her looking in the mirror and trying to smile, yeah. but then like feeling like regretful and like self hating about it. And then of course we get like such a really important scene where she meets Letty, and like literally every single guy in shot at any point <laughs> is like, "Hey, Letty, how you doing? Uh, yeah. Nice Letty, guys, look this like, way. R slash nice guys, bunch uh, of simps. <laughs> yeah, doing yeah. <laughs> they really They're all are simping over Letty." And like every, every person just completely ignores uh, yeah. Sophie. You know, like none of them say hi to her. Yeah, they don't even. So they really don't get even this massive dynamic. Yeah. yeah, great, great. Which, and it makes sense which, which that they're sisters like as well. The, so it kind of establishes which, that this is how Sophie and Letty have been like maybe their whole lives. Yeah, like, this has always been the dynamic, and it, it's it says so much character wise. Which is also like so. very much needed because she has a Ghibli face. So if they put a contextual thing about her being a a reserved beauty, we would believe them because. She she has the Ghibli face. They're all like actually really pretty to look yeah, at. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's definitely an important thing because like we said yeah. last uh, the, with Spirited Away, where uh, Chihiro kind of has like a like definitely less of like a, meant to be like an attractive, cute face, but very importantly, and like it's it's also a point that Sophie's face is the kind of the 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 cute Ghibli face that is a beauty, but like she she can't accept that about herself. That's right. And there's even a line from the novel that is that uh, you know the, the, this. This idea in the fantasy world where they're from, there's this myth that's sort of like a, a wives tale, old wives tale about how the eldest of three daughters will be the first to fail in seeking their fortune or, you know, in life, they'll be the first to fail. And so Sophie feels that as the eldest, she already has been hindered. She she has these feelings that she's not beautiful, but uh, Diana Wynne Jones makes it clear but actually she was quite beautiful you know as all of her sisters were but she Mm -hmm. had this false conception about herself which i think Mm -hmm. is exactly how curses in general in this film work they 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 materialize out of the insecurities of the bearer of the curse and not because of what has been it's it's simultaneously what has been projected on them by other people or by society but it's something that they own right if they over the course of the movie as as you know sophie d ages it's as you know miyazaki said it's because she forgets her age right it's because she doesn't feel old anymore and she she rejects the premise that she's old in like you know subconsciously yeah. but at the beginning yeah. of the film well, I, I, she's I think very old in, yeah she's very old and she prog- progressively gets like a little less old each time yeah yeah like, it's, it, it, start, it really start ties in more to a to what's interesting about it is right at the beginning of the film 
when she's she's first turned old, she gets used to it so amazingly quickly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Susan so Napier nice. even yeah, pointed this out. It where it's like usually the whole movie would be like every line of her dialogue is how do I break the curse? How do I turn young again? But it's like very quickly she makes herself the nice housekeeper of Hal's house. And it's like, yeah, she kind of just likes being old because she always saw, saw herself as kind of like an old lady or like maybe she saw herself as like she was born to die an old lady and she wasn't ever really going to find a marriage. Uh, that's, I think, I think it's different than that. Like that. I, I think There's it's, a liberation to it, right? Yeah. yeah, like, like, yeah. If you're old, people take yeah. care of you. Yeah, she kind of likes being an old lady because there's this way, like the whole factor of this beauty that's this kind of thing that's been hanging over exactly. her. Exactly. It doesn't, doesn't play have to a factor. It's been femininity. completely removed. Yeah. Also, she turns really feisty. She's like, yeah, just, yeah. you know, let me ride on the She's back of your thing and I'll walk into the mountains. <laughs> right, and also, there's really this contrast that between uh, the old, like the young her where she like, she walks alone, she actively avoids crowds in every shot that she's in. Uh, she and then shrinks from these right men. as she leaves the house as her, as the old lady, um, she crosses a bridge and like, I, I think this like communicates it so, uh, so quickly and beautifully. Um, she doesn't really care about the train that's running right underneath her and, and just like pumps off a bunch of smoke. <laughs> and like, it shows that she really doesn't care anymore. Like she has urgency now. Yeah, uh, as an old lady, you don't give a also, shit. Important scene that happens right at the beginning is like another one, that, like we said with Letty, where we get to see like a a map of how her life was up to this point with all the the, the men fawning over Letty. The two men who do pay her attention are, of course, the two like lecherous uh, uh, soldiers who kind of like completely objectify her the moment they meet her. Right, and they even call her like kitten or like a, a, a mouse, mouse. I think it was actually. Yeah, and they're like, she says like fuck off basically to them, and they're like, oh, you're a feisty one. And it's like, so even the the opposite sex interactions she's used to are probably something like this. Right, where she feels like she has no agency. She feels like she's just treated as like a thing, and it's not nothing to do with kind of like any beauty she has or would show to anyone else it's merely like men just see a pair of legs and so and that they go after it so that's all right. she thinks of herself as you yeah know. It, i think i think that that it's that transformation the curse right and this goes back into the way you know curses work in the film and also the witch of the waste in my opinion you know the witch of the waste is somebody who also cares very much about her appearance and yes, appearing yes, that's young that's clear. right mm -hmm. Uh, her curse on Sophie is something symbolical of her, you know, of her belief that youth is wasted on the young. Mm. She herself is someone who covets youth, uh, both as an aesthetic for herself because of her vanity. And also, she also covets the youthful heart of Howell, right? That, as a way to sort of, uh, you know, prop up herself or almost as a fetishization. Yeah, she 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 you. doesn't so, like she 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 doesn't want it because she's in love with Hal. She wants it's, it's a possessive want. Like she, she wants to have his heart and and it, it will be hers and she, she will have it because she will have somehow earned it and that will prove something. So so is that you think the reason why she then curses Sophie like the idea ah oh, come on fuck you young thing I'll could just curse you because you know fuck yeah, you. Because or, yeah, because she attracted Hal's how was, attention. With that, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah, think okay, this is yeah. also oh, okay. An, yeah. I think this is also another rejection of regular like fairy tale tropes where the main character, like obviously she gives some uh some kind of a shit about being old because she doesn't want to die in the next ten years, maybe. Um but but obviously it's not like something that she is constantly worried about, I guess, or something that ties into her characters mm. herself. And, the, the, okay. and, and it, it, it's a great like little thematic, uh, like, like the, the way the antagonist and protagonist in this case, uh, the Witch of the Waste and Sophie interact in that curse. It, it's a, it's, I, I think you're, you're, you're right on the money uh, voice because um, the, uh, the Witch of the Waste has this idea that age itself is, is, is a curse uh, mm -hmm. when, when, uh, when put upon someone uh, so young and beautiful uh as well maybe not beautiful youthful. like yeah youthful as, as her and, and it's like haha now Hal won't give a shit about you and i can go back to chasing him <laughs> that's right uh, because and that's it, why Hal ran away from her <laughs> yeah exactly um but but the thing she misunderstands 
is that like age in itself is not like ugly uh, in in a way, and right. like uh, the the curse she puts upon her seems to be like a, a, a surface level uh, expression of something internal, and That's so right. her w- whenever her internal like vitality and beauty comes out, that beauty is reflected in her. And it's very clear, uh, is, is especially after uh, she, she gets the light bulb blitz uh, done at her, um, that the Witch of the Waste is very ugly on the inside and refuses to accept it. And, and, it, and it's like, and is actually this like shriveled, like sad thing to look at uh, yeah. within, with, with this like exterior. And and it's of her own making. It's it's not like Absolutely. something put She's upon her. Absolutely, she's abused her body with yeah. you know all these you know substances and magic, uh, in in trying to you know stave off the the you know aesthetics of age, and uh, and in doing so, she has in effect aged herself even more rapidly and even more severely. Uh, but I think it's I think it's still beautiful. One of the things that. When Jones, I think, was at first a little befuddled by was why, uh, you know, the Witch of the Waste is is somewhat redeemed by the end of the film because in her book she is not. She's she, uh, yeah. She she, this... she, uh, she spoke in an interview about how, uh, um, like it, it, Jones herself be- believed that some people really actually are irredeemable. Uh, yeah, to, whereas to, Miyazaki to does not. Right? He doesn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, but but you know. When the Witch of the Waste is forced to come face to face with her, with her age, right? The Solomon, Solomon's magic strips the illusion away, right? It's this, you know, it's saying, hey, look at yourself. You are, have run yourself ragged, you know? And, but even, you know, as, as the Witch of the Waste comes somewhat to accept her, her, you know, age and infirmity. Uh, she she does become more humble and she becomes more grounded, and is even able to you know offer some wisdom to Sophie as somebody who is actually, you know, elderly and has a wealth of experience over her life. She is able to give counsel to Sophie, and, you know, as as Sophie is sort of pining over Howell, and she says, "Oh, you're in love, aren't you?" <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know she has some amazing lines that just like just the, the, her fascination with Calcifer. what a pretty little fire and, well, and what a nice dog with, with and that and was a I think, I think by the way <laughs> yeah definitely the subtext for her still coveting uh house oh, yeah. hard almost exactly. all the way up to the end absolutely because i think ex- the, the ex- main thing with the, the witch thing of the with waste Heen. except heen that's just a nice dog that she thinks is a nice that's dog true. <laughs> no, the, it's, ma- it's the main pure. thing with the, the witch of the waste is yeah i think she's she's 100 percent fetishizing like the appearance and the aesthetic and idea of youth while not actually i guess you could say like like living it because really i feel that the whole obvious metaphor with so sophie's aging back and forth is that you know you're as young as you feel you are yeah age and it really really like, yeah. age is just a number yeah in certain legal parameters yeah. except maybe not um <laughs> while, yeah. while we're while we're at this like i find the scene so remarkable where both sophie and the witch of the waste climb the stairs uh, up to the king yeah oh, that's yeah. a great that's so scene and oh, right sophie, out of actually, there. <laughs> sophie actually needs to turn around again go back grab the dog carry the dog with her and be like there's like this compassionate version, which is like Sophie taking the dog and carrying him up, where the Witch of the Waste formerly tried to ride up there on a vehicle and was forbidden from doing it. And hey, it's actually, like this, uh, side yeah. question here. Um, if it, if she had not turned around and gotten Heen back w- up with her, would Suleiman just have lost a valuable spy at that point? <laughs> I feel like the dog was just being an asshole because yeah. the dog probably could have gotten up there. Well, he can fly, still, don't yeah. you know? Like, he can use yeah, yeah, yeah. fly. You're right. <laughs> he does it once in the whole movie. What a fucking <laughs> asshole. So, the the yeah. dog, I will say, was a weird addition to me. Um, it just, like, hopped on as they flew away from the castle. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so back to the Witch of the Waste. I, wa- I want to talk about the scene at the very end when... Uh, since we're kind of, I think this will kind of put a capstone on on the Witch of the Waste, but uh, the 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 scene at the end where she does realize, oh, 
Howl's heart is, that's like, Calcifer is Howl's heart. Calcifer has Howl's heart and she grabs it. She's still in that mode, as, as Hipster Cthulhu said. She's still covered, covets, you know, uh, covered, covets that youthful heart as, as a way to possess Howl, right? Somebody who previously rejected her, but, you know, for before being old and ugly. And now she wants to possess him, right? And control him. But I think... If we look at it more symbolically of, again, going back to what fire and magic represent in the movie as these, uh, you know, the, the energy of ingenuity and creativity and artistic expression, I think that Miyazaki is really uh, inserting himself into the Witch of the Waste because he himself has denied his old age continuously over his life to continue to toil as an auteur director. Uh, but at the same time, he finally, he, he, he wants to let go. He wants to let go. He wants to finally be able to trust the next generation. Oh, he wants handling. to retire. Oh my he God. He wants yeah. to retire. Oh God. He, he wants to finally give <laughs> so off bad. and pass the torch, right? To Yeah. And, and then Osoda disappointed him. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that he's still hopeful that I mean he he believes in in the youth right he does yeah. he think he he sees the world as as almost you know uh, unstoppable in in its corruption yeah but yeah. he still has to have faith he he has to hold on to it it's it's it, not that he yeah he actually it's not that he has the faith it's just that he has to hold on yeah. to that. So, so, Susan Napier made sure to mention in her chapter on House Moving Castle also that at this point, Studio Ghibli had expanded to the point where they had an actual like own daycare center for the children of like mm -hmm. the the, the <clears throat> animators with children in the studio. So like Miyazaki authored like, yeah, build a daycare facility for the kids here. <laughs> that's, that's such a Miyazaki thing to do. Like it really reflects this point of like his, his like idea of trying to nurture and nurse like yeah. all everyone working at Studio Ghibli and the children included. Yeah, I, 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 I think that moment of... Are you saying he got the children to work on the film as well? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, Miyazaki always says he wants to make movies that children will enjoy. That's like yeah. his main thing. He constantly says it. And like... Uh, talking about like his impetus to make movies it's uh, when i ask myself uh, uh, how i want to make this movie i ask myself who i want to show it to and it's always like kids some kids that he knows or other yeah. kids or like kids that he wants to teach something and yeah uh, often little girls also like with kiki's delivery service yeah. specifically like i want to and show little away. girls uh, that they can do it you know um Wait, but, I, I wanted to get like but back with the the witch of the waste it's yeah. like yes. the, the moment where she like grabs the heart and ruins the whole thing and eventually has to give it back. I, it, it's it's such an amazing like like final moment for an antagonist because because it's no longer like threatening or ominous. It's just sad. It feels mm. like you, you know an, an old like slightly demented woman trying to, to to like hold on to something that she obviously can't control and like right. going back to old habits when they when they turn up. And, and and it and it's treated as such. Like Sophie, like goes to there and like, you 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 have to give that back. Like d you you you're fooling yourself. I'm so sorry. And it's like, okay, it, there's not there's not really any sense of victory within the witch when when she gets it. And and it's unclear what exactly she wanted to do with it in the first place. It's, it's well, just kind of pathetic. It. What didn't she? No, at that point, it's just like. Desire, I think, relatively blind it. desire. Yeah. She is like already has lost like her witch being. Basically, she's now just this old lady, and she still like looks at the flame, finds it beautiful, and grabs it. Like she wants right. to relive her youth. She wants to recapture it, and 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 she 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 wants to pretend as if, you know, by having this, by by keeping, what is you know the magic from the new generation, that she can. Re you know, retain her youth and and perhaps live forever i i think that there's a commentary on the boomer generation here oh i mean yeah, yeah. maybe uh i, I mean i think I think, I think by the end of course like of course she's like forgiven and understood by sophie right like sophie extinguishes her and calcifer at the same time to yeah, save her yeah. but it's also that she's not only risking herself by burning up Everything around them is also falling apart because she won't allow 
Sophie, who in this case, in my reading, embodies the next generation. Which of the ways, why did you allow climate change to happen? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. You're literally burning uh, right now. I, th I think a reading that's also very uh, connected to like particularly what's happening in, in, in Japan when the movie's being made is the the idea that like uh, there were more and more old people like Japan even now has an increasingly aging population mm. with low birth rates. And it's this idea that uh, the old people in Japan won't be taken care of and they won't like have a family that like looks after them. And the Witch of the Waste basically was an old lady with no family, no one to take care of her. Right. And she just coveted youth all the time. But she gave up Calcifer's heart so she can live in the house with the family. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. And yeah, the, yeah the, there's, there's also the whole like power uh, versus like connection with others, which like, yes. like, 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 uh, it, with with the king and, and Suleiman also, there's this sense that they have like all these people who do all this this stuff for them. They have all this power and influence, and they use it for what? Like to what end? Yeah. Um. And and, and like, uh, funnily enough, like both uh, Suleiman and uh, the Witch of the Waste covet. Um. Uh, they they want Howl, like they, uh, for, for for different right. reasons, obviously, yeah. but but but. Uh, but the one who gets Howl is the one with like the least power in the whole uh, in the whole story. You know, there's an interesting cleaning motif that also ties into the Witch of the Ways, uh, a purification motif, I want to say, mm -hmm. because Sophie has so many positions where she purifies people, right? She cleans right. the house. She sends the gooified Howl into the bathroom to clean himself up. She, uh, uh, um, you know... Uh, uh, constantly does this and she like instead of like what happens to the Witch of the Waste which is put being electrocuted by Suleiman and like put on blast and destroyed into this like husk of herself basically what Sophie does is chuck water at her and yeah. forgive her that is the purification yeah, but, uh, uh, the, that's, the contrast um, there would I find very that, interesting that's actually <laughs> something um, uh, I, I, I wanted to mention as, uh, as well um because that I think that that ties back into the adaptation of the book. Because as I understand it, again, I, I haven't personally read it, um, but uh, in in the book it, it's very different. Because like yeah, uh, she's not redeemed. No, no, no. Not only that, I'm talking about Sophie because Sophie oh. actually has a power in the book, um, which is to like uh, to tell things what they are. And to speak um, life into things. Speak life into things. That's that's the that's the way it's uh, it's phrased. Yes, um, w w which is like very much a like novel type of, of power, as in a writing type of power. That that I assume some fun language stuff goes on with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but she she doesn't have any like special power in uh, the the film adaptation, which which is really interesting except she kind of does and and what you get at there Nyad is like the replacement for that power is her compassion and the the whole like the the, the way that her, her physically caring for other uh for, for people around her becomes a sort of purifying ritual uh towards them um there's this interesting uh article uh, on uh, on tordup.com written by um uh, Elise Martin, um, wh wh where they get into uh, contrasting the themes of the book and the movie, and uh, and, and, and what they get at is um, th th this idea that the book, uh, written in the eighties, uh, had this central tension not of war, but of like a patriarchal society that like did not really have room for someone like like Sophie within it, and. Sophie's power is uh, like to talk life in it to, to to make things uh, come alive with the way she talks about them is like a, a symbolic of the how we can change the world by because our perspectives are important even if the world doesn't believe them to be um so 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 that is sort of the way to combat uh that that the, the, the sort of world that's set in its ways where Miyazaki goes in and replaces that central tension with the tension of war, and there, uh, and in that situation, the power that's needed is exactly like compassion and connection with others. Uh, as the article concludes, um, uh, to break the curse of misogyny, speak up. To break the curse of war, 
you only need to connect. Uh, and, and, and I think that's just a really interesting way of like looking at uh, the protagonist and her quote unquote power. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think that's that's exactly what Miyazaki was going for, is that it, it, her she doesn't need magical powers to connect with people. She just needs compassion. Yeah. And that gets us directly into the whole big theme of like the found family and love and connections that goes through the, the, the whole movie uh, into its like a nice triumphant finale of a, a family that's been gathered. We, we haven't really talked about Markle at all uh, yeah, at this so point. Markle Fuck is- Markle. <laughs> no. What? No. Okay, so I, I have a couple points I want to bring up about Markle if it's if it's uh, a good time because uh, I was just going to say something quickly uh, sure. if we're going to say one last thing oh, about yeah. Sophie because yeah, sure. I feel like this ties into the found family thing as well. It's yeah, absolutely. Like, we're still talking aging. about Sophie. Yeah. yeah, because to me the most important thing about Sophie is of course her curse, which is like the biggest visual motif about her. And there's like four scenes that are like critical in which she like de ages like visibly before us and these are all like tie into her development where the first is i believe where she's talking to a uh, to witch cheney uh, about <laughs> like how yeah. how howl is like kind of a deadbeat and kind of a uh like a coward but he's also like so like full of life and he's so full of imagination and fun and she like visibly as she's Almost falling in love with him as yeah. mid speaking. Yeah, it's, she, it's like, a beautiful animation. She just wants has to room be free. And she like turns younger. Yeah. Uh, and then the next scene, I believe, is the one where Howell shows her that he's made a room for her in the house, which <sighs> really ties into the whole adopted family thing, where it's like she turns youthful and young because she sees that she has a place here. Like Howell has made a place for her here. Thanks for bringing and, that um, up, hipster, because I, there is an. She also re-ages when she goes into her little bedroom that Hal says, oh, I, uh, and I, I got a room that's, that's perfectly suited to you. And she goes yeah, in yeah. and that was that her new bedroom, by the way, because they merged with the hat shop. That used to be her work booth, like her little closet that she would construct hats in. And she says, oh, well, it's perfect for a cleaning lady. And as she says this, she starts to re-age. Yeah, she, she goes back a bit because she, she thinks, thinks of herself as maybe just like a mechanical part of this family. She's just here to clean, you know, not right. just she's a, a worker, not like a member of the family. Yeah, she and feels then, course, this insecurity. She gets, she gets much younger again when she sees the field of flowers. Mm-hmm. It's like, again, like this big romantic scene between her and Hal in which showing the field of flowers is almost Hal outright saying, I love you in, in this mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. But and I think really interestingly, the moment in which the curse is broken isn't like a like isn't really like like lingered lingered on or like put importantly in the movie. It's yeah. just as the air raid starts. Right. Sophie turns back young and doesn't turn back old for the whole rest of the movie. Right. So she that's decides pretty much that... where the curse was broken. And yeah, she decides the family is what it's important. Right. Owl and all the other people, their lives are on the line and she just needs to do everything she can to protect that. And that's when the curse mm. is broken. She fully She's takes found her... a place. She, yeah, yeah, she has she has a place and she has her agency. Right. I, I guess I, I just read that as that she had so much love that the curse didn't matter anyway, but... Oh, no, yeah, it's totally... Much, but that's just like, I, I think, I, I, like, it's really noticeable that she doesn't turn old at any other point after that. So like, Yeah, yeah th- 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 and there's no ceremony point. to it. There's there's no moment no. Of yeah, where, there's, where, like, there's the no sparks fly and, point, oh, yeah. she's cured. No, no, she just stops she just being old <laughs> at yeah. one point. Mm-hmm. It, it, also, it, notably, her detail. hair is long enough because if she was old, the hair, her hair, like grows shorter to like a little, just a ponytail. Yeah, but like it's really long when she's young, and that's just enough to make the contract with Calcifer. So that's yeah. like another po- part of like the important like marriage. Oh, interesting. Uh, symbolism with the hair as well. You know, I want to talk about the flower field because um, there's this sort of idea, right, that a a true good gift that is to represent one's love for another should be completely uh, impractical and superfluous, <laughs> right? If it's Because if it serves a practical purpose, then it can't really be just uh, a symbol of love, right? At that point, it's utilitarian. Yeah, like the bedroom. She, she like, saw of it as love, but then she kind of remembered the work and like her right. role as a housekeeper. And, so and kind of went well, back her work old. as as maintaining the hat shop, and and she she suddenly felt this sort of um, 
almost like as a domestic servant is that is, is she had this insecurity of like is that really how how yeah and, and, then, then, about and then afterwards when Howell like shows her the flower fields and and the old work uh the, the, the workshop down there um the um like sh she has like this feeling like oh he he, he showed me th this beautiful thing because he wanted to show me and he even like spent some time preparing it not not like immediately conjuring the flowers but like just just, just enhancing the earth a bit and grow. like th 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 there's something really sweet and, and again it's something impractical you can't own a flower field but then it turns out no actually this has a practical purpose it talks about yes. oh you could sell the flowers and you could keep living on and it's like oh this is a thing for you to feel better mm. about leaving it's not for me yeah exactly um, it becomes yeah. you t yeah, exactly it becomes him trying to put her into a place where she'll be safe because she'll she'll have something to support herself financially and he's going to go off and provide the physical protection from the invasion of the war which of course uh he fails at doing anyway but he you know it's it's the which is goes back to the point of it being you know uh just running away is futile the you know conflict and you know war will will always follow it has to be actively uh actively combated not by participating in it but by forming connections um and so yeah that's that's the the point when when she realizes oh these flowers are for me to sell question mark and he's like uh you know and then and then she says you know I'm scared, Hal. It feels like you're going to go away. And then he basically admits, you know, I just want you to be secure and stuff. And, you know, she's then she says, well, you know, if there's one good thing about, uh, about, uh, what did she say? Is is that if there's the one good thing, thing about, about being aging, old, yeah, is, is that you don't have anything to lose. Right. Mm. Exactly. So it's that is she immediately feels old because the one thing that she wants to protect and and to not protect as an object but to to protect as a person who is in a relationship with her you know that's mutually supportive is howl and he is about to abandon that relationship for his yeah. own sense of uh you know yeah, abandon it in the name of the same relationship yeah it's, how how yeah. how you know messed up is that it's but it's so, so like the way it comes together it's so beautiful yeah and i i love how that that dynamic that blah, 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 sorry <laughs> that dynamic also ties into um the the uh the found family dynamic of uh of of the castle like uh you, that, that that's why Marcellus is actually an important character. He's mostly yes. important for the way he relates to Sophie uh, and how um, it, right. it's actually interesting how um, even before she arrives, how does kind of have this paternal role within yeah. the, the castle. He's uh, he's the head of the household, like almost literally um, he's uh, he's working. He goes on like long, you know, trips to do stuff you know kind of like uh an old salary man and gets back like all tired and slumps down and stuff um but he, he also like it has a tutoring role and he has markle his apprentice who is learning the ropes of the job um and interestingly he, yeah. it's th these ropes by the way it's it's uh i love that there's a deal made about how markle disguises himself because the way that Howell is, you know, attempting to teach Markle, which is can be, you know, expanded into, you know, raising a boy to become a man, uh, except for the 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 tutor or the you know uh, the mentor is also a man child himself, and so he doesn't actually have the knowledge and wisdom of true maturity. And uh, not, and not even just that, he's like absent most of the time. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well. But but he also is trying to teach, and he has given Markle at home. I wanted to bring up Markle. I guess since we're talking about it now, in in the book, Markle is a little bit older. Uh, but he is an orphan before, finally, after having not been able to find a place to take him in, he goes where no one else is willing to go, out into the wastes, and is eventually come upon by. The castle, because of course, the castle being run by Calcifer is Hal's heart, which is compassionate and seeks out those that are 
in in need of of a family, and he Markle falls asleep on the steps of the castle, and uh, and then when Howell comes out to uh, one day to go about his business, he he just falls into the house, and he he just becomes uh, a member of the household. He's invited in by Calcifer. Um and even though that's not explicit in the text of the movie, you know, it's clear that Markle is, uh, he, there's no indication that he's related to Howell uh, by by blood. It's just that he is being cared for by Howell. He's been given a place and he's been, you know, Howell is trying to invest in the future generation, right? He's, it shows that Howell still, you know, uh, has investment in the livelihood of future generations and their success. And, and, uh, but Howell is also kind of clueless on how to do that, except for by giving the mechanical or, you know, uh, teaching, teaching knowledge, but without having, you know, the, the emotional maturity. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah. I, th- I think you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm mentioning that he has this paternal role, but that doesn't mean like he's good at it. Um, yeah. But 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 I I think um, what I wanted to get at is what what Sophie comes along and adds is she does the work of keeping a household, of keeping a home, which is yeah. work. Like like it, it it's it gets back to like Miyazaki's love of of, of like his belief in the virtue of of labor. Uh, at, at at least like labor you do for um, like to actually accomplish things and maintain uh things um and and we have her arriving and uh, and like the first thing she she does once like she wakes up after her nap and stuff um is like she's like oh you you should you should have a hot breakfast and uh, and she uh, and, and and she goes to to like get calcifer to to like come on be a fire. Come, come, we, 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 need to, we need this. We need this to be done. And then we have, of course, the legendary, the supreme bacon and eggs scene. Holy now fuck! Bacon bird. <laughs> it's so good. I hate when movies make me hungry like this. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, those <laughs> eggs and bacon look big, so good. Huge, like head-sized slices of bacon oh, and eggs. Yeah, like um, the the um, the the film magazine uh, Brightwall Dark Room uh, had an article about. Howl's Moving Castle and like the theme of like consumption and food in it. It's mainly just an excuse for the writer to gush about that scene because holy crap. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great. Damn. No, but the way, um, the way yeah. Calcifer crunches the eggshells. <laughs> yeah, the little de- the, how like like Howl like uh, arrives and and is like I got this and then that, that's of course when you fall even deeper in love with him if you weren't already because he can cook, you know. <laughs> Yeah, wow, well, true. Yeah, he, uh, he, the way he cracks those eggs with one hand, I just—I mean, just just mwah. the way he sort of, just the way he sh- sort of brushes up against Sophie is. Oh yeah. Oh okay. my god. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and, and that that's like also like a really. Uh, it feels at least to me um, like it's a very like feminine thing to notice, like to make note of that exact that specific moment where he brushes up and like does like the work in in front of her. That that that's. It 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 feels like a like a that might just be me projecting or something, but like it feels specifically feminine that type of yeah uh, romantic moment. Well, I think um, I think there is a point that Howell is trying to reject you know the uh, the hegemonic masculinity of of his society. He he he, he the way he dresses, the way he does his hair, you know, uh, and even down to you know, willingness to do housework. Uh, and I think that that's, that's sort of like the first point where it shows that he does have this more sensitive side that's not just purely, you know, womanizing and, and vain. Uh, that even if he's not good at it, even if though his house is basically disheveled completely and, you know, Markle even states, you know, oh, we can't cook because the only person who can, you know, who yeah, can yeah. cook is, is, is Howl. But like, that there's only three clean utensils. <laughs> yeah. The, the, <laughs> what was it? Two, you know, two spoons like at home. <laughs> it's clear that Howell doesn't cook yeah. very often, but he can and he's willing to. 
uh, especially because he's been given an example by Sophie, right? Yeah, yeah. but uh, that's what I uh, wanted to get at before we had this tangent because that fucking scene. Oh my god, um, right. which uh, like like she does the actual labor of keeping the house, which means like not only like the cleaning cleaning lady thing, but like just doing stuff and being around for Markle, the the surrogate son in this uh, in this instance. Um, right. like, like to just not taking Calcifer's bullshit, uh, and, and, and like, just, uh, just looking around and, and fixing things up and, uh, and making, just making time for, for things. That's, that's part of the work of making like a household into like a home. Uh, yeah. and, and she does all that. So, so even, even before they become more of a, of a like official couple, um, she like she all, already has that that role in the household of uh, of maternity, which is also why, mm-hmm. of course, like Markle like really starts appreciating and loving her pretty quickly because he clearly needs that, um, that that that, that family uh, connection. Yeah, that, after, that, you know and, the and scene it's, that it's, yeah, it's it's all these small moments even. Of her, oh like, uh, like when they're going out shopping for food, yeah. and Michael's like, "I don't like potatoes," and it's like, "Come on, just, just, just pay up. Pay up. We're having potatoes. <laughs> you're, having, you're gonna eat the potatoes." And then he says, yeah. "I you can eat fish. your veggies." And then yeah. and she's like, "Yo!" But then, of course, there's the interruption with the, yeah, with the yeah. war. That's that's an interesting scene because there's there's these dual tensions of the of the witch of the wastes, you know. Uh, I, I don't call them henchmen or goons because they don't seem to have autonomy they're, they're an extension of herself oh, right we could call them, we could call them goose <laughs> because they're not goons but they're right. wild goose chase but then but then there's also uh-huh. this very much this this violence of the war with the with the destroyed battleship and and all of the you know sailors jumping ship to to get to shore and and then the propaganda being dropped by the enemy over everybody's heads. And, and she just says, I've had enough. I, 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 I need to go home. And that's one of the moments where she really, she gets very out of breath as she's climbing up the stairs of the entrance of, of the house. She's, she, she feels old because of the unrest around her. And, and she, feels, she feels, you know, small and powerless in the face of this, you know, larger conflict. Um, but but then you know, uh, it's all the more impactful that it's really her familiar con- familial connections, these connections that she makes to with her found family, that is essentially what emotionally brings a close to the war. But yeah. I, I suppose so. I think it it's noticeable that um her she's like. What am I trying to say? She, she, uh, I always say she adopts this like granny persona where she mm-hmm. is the housekeeper. She's here to clean. She's here to like serve a function. And we say she bosses around Calcifer. She kind of like becomes a mother figure to Merkel. So in this way, we kind of get like she's found a persona that she can like steal herself with and like, l- like live out this kind of idea of what she should be. But then, like we said, the vulnerability of the house at the end where the heart is out on display, mm. she has to, like, become, like, more intimate than that. She has to become more than just, like, an old lady that can make jokes about being a witch oh, to, like, yeah. brush off anything. She has <laughs> to, like, be uh, herself properly to live with the rest of the family. Right. But it's... it's I, I, I love how uh, her, in the end, her, her embracing of her own youthfulness and her own feminine expression, you know, that isn't defined by these patriarchal, you know, uh, definitions. Uh, she, she wears a very simple gown. It's, it's yellow though, rather than the dark, uh, Mm. before it's, it's, it's this more sunny color. Uh, and her hat has also changed though. It's not gaudy and, you know, ostentatious like her mom's hats are. It's still very simple. But she, you know, she starts off with the straw hat with the red band with the two beads. And in the end, she has a much a a larger brimmed hat. It's still a straw hat, but it has a black band. Uh, And I don't know, I feel like there's something of her personality and confidence in that, that she can, 
it, it's like it's like how yeah. how it, it's, it's, it's once the, again the, once again it's all in the animation performance and and the, de- yeah. the animated details there's no line of dialogue that indicates how she's changed but you can feel it like it's it's really good she was able to put on a different hat, but it's still a hat that <laughs> is a, a, it yeah. fits her, right? It, it's not something that she's uh, performing. It's not performative. It's completely her her expression. Yeah. I, I I also because we talked about Markle and and you know maternity and Sophie's expression of that. I love the scene when she's in the hat shop again after the castle has merged with it, and her mother comes to visit. Of course, we find out later that her mother uh, was coming as a, like an, an agent of Solomon, and is in yeah. Fact she, she was talked into it, and she was yeah. She's betraying. By the way, she has already found a new husband at this point because she mentions to one of Solomon's little uh, weird howl clones uh, that. Uh, Oh, I never thought of them like husband. that. Yeah, bring me to my husband. I never bring, thought bring of the, the clone, like like the, the, <laughs> the clone characters, uh, the, the, the servants of Su- 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 Suleiman, the, these like blonde head boys. I never thought of them as Howl, but like, oh yeah, hang on a second. <laughs> oh yeah, no. That, that does make sense. Even though youthful Howl did have black hair, I guess maybe yeah, she right. still remembers him having yeah. blonde hair. I thought it was just a way to communicate that they were all mages in training. Yeah, they are, yeah, but, maybe. but they're very much, uh, I, I think they are modeled after Hal because she, even though they're mages in training, she has already given up on all the future generations of students. She would is only going to be satisfied if Hal succeeds her. Mm-hmm. It's, it's definitely a very self-aggrandizing um, uh, projection onto Howl, right? Uh, Howl is a vehicle for her own... Um, legacy so to speak which it's is why she's fun. so fixated on on howl and how she, you know all yeah. of her new students kind of emulate him but yeah. but, but uh, what you, I wanted you're to get getting back, into the, the the mother visiting, yes right? i wanted to get back so you know um sophie's mother uh is you know she seems to be running away from her uh, you know responsibility as a parent, she she uh, in the beginning of the movie, she allows Sophie to shoulder the burden of tending to the shop while while she seeks, you know, a new husband in the city. And she's also, you know, searching for, you know, new uh, fashion statements and things which uh, are weirdly nationalistic because of these inclusion of the cannons on her hat. Right. But it's that she's she's almost indifferent to Sophie. She because Sophie this is my this is my reading because Sophie is still feels so much responsibility to her father. Uh, Sophie's mother feels like she has to distance herself from Sophie in order to have the freedom to pursue a new husband. Um, mm. And when she comes to visit Sophie, her tears are very much alligator tears. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's it's this contrast because she leaves behind the peeping bug, which is. You know, so she 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 came there just on a mission, right? She didn't really go there because she cared about Sophie. She was instructed to do so. She she uh, maybe maybe she was strong armed into doing it by Solomon. I wouldn't doubt it. You know, but her motivations are not pure. And um, but then Sophie doesn't for a second question her authenticity. You know, she says she says, well, at least she cared enough to to visit you know, yeah. to visit and and then markle gets very scared and she's like you know because because he sees how you know sophie's mother and he's like oh is sophie gonna go back and, and live with her mother oh yeah this is just, this is just and that she little says, you know are you gonna are you gonna leave are you gonna leave sophie you know uh and she says mm-hmm. no markle i'm not going to leave and he says because we're a family now right and she says, yes, because we're a family. And it's just like, oh, because her, even though she's not actually Markle's biological mother, she has so much more care and love for him than even her own mother, her own biological mother has for her. And it's this, this contrast. 
that 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 might be actually like this this might be a, like a bit of a personal thing uh to mention but like that might be one of the reasons why uh why how resonates strongly with some people and not as much with others like my family we're, we're cool like it, it 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 it's it's all good so, so the whole found family it, it it's beautiful but it's it's not something that i long for in any way um uh, m- m- maybe that's not the, the the case uh for you i just uh thought it might be well like an I interesting think, point no I, I i myself have very good relations with my family i'm okay, blessed okay. in that way but i do think that you know uh going back to the you know marco and porco rosso being isolate isolating himself you know it's this idea that hey no no person is an island you can't live that way that's not human it's inhuman to do so you will deprive yourself of a central of of something central to to being you know a healthy human being and um and so for people who are alone who who don't have family or whose families reject them uh i it's it's such a wonderful depiction of how you know blood ties and such uh, have you know they they don't mean anything if you can find people to to be a family with you know yeah. it's you just have to connect you just have to d- decide to care yeah I, I think that's core to the to the like the journey you go on when watching Howl's Moving Castle like the journey Sophie goes on is from ha- from from this superficial crush on this uh, magical pretty boy who like rescues you into like understanding how like th- this this guy's really troubled to like becoming part of this family unit where your love for him is not the only thing in the world and and there's like there's a deeper connection there uh th- this uh, familial thing w- which is why like the romance of it is so satisfying i think it might be the best romance that miyazaki has ever done but of course mm. it is like an adaptation so yeah I mean, there's Wind Rises. Uh, yeah, did, did we oh, talk yeah, the about Wind the, Rises, the, to that. Oh, so did we talk about the Black Door and how that's like the final part of the whole romance? Oh. I don't know if we brought it up. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, th- right. that's yeah the fi- the big the big final the big climax. Uh, it's it's so interesting because like the 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 film has uh, is filled with the, these little moments of like tension and adventure of like flying away from these uh, goos and uh, and and hiding from them and. Uh, and and how transforming and and, go, and going wild and stuff, but like the 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 big climax is just uh, Sophie being alone and sad and wanting to see how and she sees him, but like she sees what what made him the way he is, and then she finds him for real this time, and just like s- resolves the curses in 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 good in good order. It's 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 such such a strange like such a non I was about to say like non-violent but like I don't know it's it, it, I think it's emblematic of of this strange structure or lack thereof of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think so obviously the um the black door or like I don't know I guess the black segment on the the door wheel that we uh we know that Hal never. Uh, lets anyone else through or no one else knows where it goes it is just so you know of course like howl himself that's what's behind the door his like truest deepest heart that he always goes into to become like crow man because that's again where he puts all of his rage and his anger against the world it's a it's also image. where we see his memories and his childhood and it's where sophie goes to the deepest part of him as like the final connecting in their relationship yeah well I think that um you know Sophie he uh, she already has started to see um who Howell truly is uh I think as early as well I think the moment where it's it shows really that she has already connected emotionally to the true Howell is when she's facing against Solomon and telling her, you know, you know, giving her speech and she's transforming young again. And that's the first moment that she really fully transforms back into her most youthful form. Only briefly. But uh, 
she, uh, you know, after that, Solomon tries to say, you know, hey, I'll show you Hal's true form, right? And her whole magic is, it's not, it's not uh, offensive in 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 a way. It, he, she's not trying to like attack Howell. He's she's she's trying to reveal to Sophie Howell's you know quote unquote true form. But what she's really doing is she's trying to say, "Hey, uh, Howell is just like any other childish, immature man child who is destructive and hateful," and uh and you know uh controlled by his you know primitive animalistic desires and uh i think i think this is really there's really some great uh imagery with the stars that sort of look like uh you know cave drawings doing a ritualistic dance uh, either that or, or little or little kids doing a doing a dance thing like yeah it just... could be children as well there and it's children's voices and the the piece that in, in the score that his she wrote is very it, it's what we could call a, a piece of primitivism uh in in music similar to like for example uh uh rite of spring um by stravinsky or uh uh carl orff um Carmina Burana, uh, these pieces try to evoke a primitive style of of musical expression of uh, you know uh, prehistoric humanity and how they may have chanted and uh, you know expressed sort of uh, maybe you know, uh, animist spiritualism and you know primal desire essentially right. So, you know, he, he's he, he's using this sort of chant-like music to evoke a more base animalistic uh, side of of Howell, which is what um, Solomon is intending to convince Sophie that that is all that Howell is. But Sophie rejects that, you know. She, she does not see him. She sees that as a symptom, which is what it is. And she sees that the heart inside, the heart of a child, the reason why it's lashing out is because of how compassionate he is and how much he cares, but but feels powerless. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the essence of Howl as a character uh, and of the romance, of course, of like uh, understanding. Yeah. Um, like the, the, the strange thing to me is like, what exactly did she find out by going through that door and seeing that flashback, what rev- what revelation was made that changed things? I have a theory about it. It's just a theory because, but yeah, exactly first, because, because it's not immediately obvious. It's, but like, go it's ahead, not immediately yeah. obvious, but um, she when she first goes through the portal, she enters the the place that she arrives at is inside of the little cottage. And there's a desk there. It's very simple. There's a little cot in the corner. There's a small hearth. There is a rifle and horn hung on the wall. And in the center, there's a little table with a litter, with a little stool. And it has, you know, a writing quill. And it has these pages. And it, the camera lingers for a while on these pages of notes with, you know, magical diagrams, which uh, are similar to the diagrams that Howell draws on the... Uh, on the ground outside of the castle and on the inside of the of the castle interior when he is merging the castle with uh, the, the hat shop. So what I take from that is those are his original plans to create the castle. This is his plan to run away. This is his, this is what he's going to execute, right? This is the moment that Howell, as a youth, decided he could not take living under the pressures of Solomon and, and you know, the future that she intended for him to follow, right? As a, as a, as a, as a vehicle of her own, uh, you know, uh, I guess political use and also self-aggrandizing. Uh, and in a way I can kind of see this as, you know, he, uh, oh, also the little, 
figure of the boat has the same like mechanical features as the castle. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty clear when you, when you notice it. But I, I, this is yeah, the first time I've actually details, noticed. But it, that's yeah, yeah, that's an amazing thing to pick out. Particularly, yeah, the the ruin that he used to like rebuild the house looks like yeah. you can see a bit of it sticking up there. Right. So it's like incredibly hard to miss. But you're right. That's a really good theory. That's really. So so she kind of comes on this point and she realizes this is a point of desperation. You know, I I I once thought, oh, you know, this could be like a suicide note or something. But mm. I, I'm not sure if that's really the direction that Miyazaki was going with it. But it's certainly a moment of 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 desperation. She has come upon the 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 exact moment that Howell, out of desperation, decided to lock away his emotions in order to fight against a society that wants to control him. Uh, and I think, yeah, there's the the thing for me that I first thought when uh, when this, oh, I saw this scene is, of course, kind of like the uh, just kind of the simple beauty of it. Like we said, she goes deep into Hal's heart, like his his deep closed away area that no one else could access, and she finally kind of sees him as like the young boy that he kind of always is. And uh, reading Susan Napier's essay on the film revealed like a really important part of just how like spiritual this sequence is because Miyazaki like I think he said like he had a dream or he had this idea of this exact scene of like a boy catching falling stars and he had it in college and he spent wow. like a lot of his career just thinking about this and wanting to put it in a movie and animate it and like this is finally a scene where he does I mean and the, result, like this, the results are scene. stunning yeah it's, it's yeah beautiful. like it's this ultimate connection between Sophie and Hal finally is this like fulfilling of Miyazaki's like a lifelong uh, image, like this very spiritual kind of thing that doesn't have like, there's no words that need to be said about it. It's, it's purely this beautiful visual of like catching a star. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I nearly forgot about that. But I, I, I also marked that, uh, that Napier talked about that. And you're right, it is very spiritual. And I think that that's also the point of this scene is that this is the ultimate confession of of weakness and vulnerability that Howell has to make in order to let Sophie connect to him, right? He has to admit to her and and it's done it's done through this sort of subliminal sequence that he needs her help because he is just, he's just been running away and uh, ever since this moment. Yeah. Right? You, know, you know, actually now I think about it, it might actually be sim- like, like even simpler than, uh, th- than the whole like seeing the moment of desperation that, that he hides away. I, I think it's more like this is exactly who Howl is. He's not the, um, he's not the flying uh many feathered uh monster uh lashing out at a at a cruel world he's not the flamboyant uh, pretty boy who whisks <laughs> you away on an adventure uh he, he's he's not even like the dude just hanging out in in the castle and cooking stuff he's a little boy who swallowed a star and never like and and never like grew up Grew, yeah, grew up from that, and and maybe that's the reason why it's so important is that she actually knows the exact like person she's looking at when she right afterwards looks at this like harrowed and blank face of, of a Howl who's almost completely lost his humanity. Right. It's oh, and you know what? Oh, that's perfect, Platon, because she's only able to see this this stripped down you know, this this core of who Hal is, she's only able to see it after the whole castle has fallen apart. <laughs> yeah, after it's stripped bare and all that's left is the heart. And that's what, you know, that that castle is the mask, it's the walls, it's it's this, you know, the the persona or or an ego of Hal. And and that has completely been stripped away. It's 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 you know, it it had to fall apart in order for the true right. core of Howell 
But but like even the we, last but, one but, but we all know that like the the real person the the real character who had to see that was uh, Heen. Heen <laughs> saw how as he truly was <laughs> in that moment. Heen also has a deep spiritual connection to Hal now apparently. <laughs> I think, I think more so i think more yeah i mean it's true but also i think he 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 attaches himself to sophie uh heen is interesting i don't know if we want to get into heen right now that might be a little bit of a tangent maybe we'll get back to i don't it think later. there's much to get into is there well actually i i have it's a fun it's a fun right, little dog that, podcast that, yeah. okay <laughs> we're doing it yeah. <laughs> what, what's that for our no, no. podcast let's go no, 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 no. <laughs> don't worry about it no 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 so okay so, so heen, heen Heen the dog, right? A dog is a symbol of loyalty, right? It's a good dog. It's a good dog. It's a sim- he's he's loyal first to Solomon, but then for some reason he betrays her and mm-hmm. you know, he shifts his loyalties to Sophie. Uh I I think I don't know. One of my uh, my theory is that, you know, Solomon, who's like a symbol of, you know, the state, specifically a sort of corrupt, profiteering, um, you know, warmongering state, uh, is uh, is proven to be not a worthy, you know, uh, receiver of the loyalty, right, of, of this dog's loyalty. And I think, I think that's kind of... Uh, Rather, the 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 actual, you know, person that deserves the loyalty is the person that, you know, is um, lifts him up the stairs, even though yeah, lifts she has no reason yeah. to. <laughs> she ha- she has compassion and she has you know, charity and she's a she creates a caring community, right? Whereas Solomon does the exact op- opposite. She, uh, she allows bombs to drop on the houses of the civilians around you know, the castle. Uh, I also think that, yeah, I, I think that it seems the dog keen seems to say that the only way in which conflicts of state can be resolved internally is when individuals question their loyalty and their subservience. That is mm. that, Okay. Is yeah, that the, due to to an ideal of of charity and commun and and community and compassion, or is it just simply out of a nationalist ideology? Right. Okay. That that's like that's the exact type of maybe overreading, but very interesting stuff that we like having. <laughs> I know in this it's podcast. a little bit overreading. I know it's overreading. <laughs> I also think that perhaps there's this inclusion of this spy character because of you know um, the increased domestic surveillance in the United States. Uh, you know, during the war in Iraq, uh, you know, ostensibly uh, to to contribute to the war on terror, you know. So uh, wait, so 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 Heen is literally like the the meme about an FBI tab. agent being your friend. It's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> not 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 telling on you to to yeah. Big Brother. <laughs> Right. Real question though: Could he climb those steps, or was he just faking it? He was lazy, <laughs> like real, real, real you know, hard facts. Wait, 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 wait. Your answer this to that a, actually a says a lot about thing. a lot, a lot of things. Because, like, if you believe that he was able to but didn't want to, then like you attribute a lot of like uh, smarts to uh, uh, to Heen and and also personality, but uh, and all, all kinds of stuff. Like, what was he testing her or some shit? But if you believe that, a... nope, he couldn't walk the stairs. Then that says a lot about Suleiman's competency in picking her spies. Right. I don't know. I think I think there's the someone. It's 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 a it's a trial of it's a trial, right? It's it's like you have to go through this uh, the this burdensome uh, trial in order to get access to you know to to the actual heads of state. I don't know. I th- I feel like there's oh, some right. <laughs> was Suleiman playing some 4D chess there. Yeah. She was just <laughs> like, "Oh, she if she does pick up the dog, then she will be worthy of a conference with me. Otherwise, <laughs> the light bulbs can just zap her." Yeah, exactly. Suleiman just invited the witch of the waste to nuke her. Like that's that's the kind of like planning we're on here. Yeah. I, yeah. I also there's another note with Heen that's interesting is that you do you, you've uh 
you probably noticed how his bark is kind of strange. It's kind of raspy and uh, and breathy. It's, it's not a bark. He's just breathing weird. No, He's it's dying. actually it's 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 a it's a case of devocalization. His his <laughs> vocal cords have actually been snipped. This is a procedure that actually people do to actual dogs what the to fuck? lower the volume. Yeah, it's considered by many to be inhumane. I did some research on it because I was like, this is interesting. Why why does what is this? Uh, and I found like yeah, it's this kind of you know wheezing sound that he makes is a procedure that's done on dogs to to hinder their ability to vocalize. So he's literally been silenced, right? Jesus fuck. By his master. So uh I don't know. I think there's there's this these implications of you know silencing voices in government uh, or silencing voices of government detractors uh you know he and, is Edward Snowden. <laughs> And and becoming subservient to a corrupt system because it's the it's the only you know, it's the path of least resistance, right? Uh, okay, so in conclusion, Heen is a good dog. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. good dog. <laughs> <laughs> Was I a good dog? No, I told you we're the best. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think I don't know where we were at before yeah. this long tangent. This, I, 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 uh, I think I think we'd come to, to to our conclusions about the the, the climactic reveal of uh, of uh, Hal's heart. All right, but um, before we uh, round things off with uh, closing remarks, any um, in, anything we haven't touched on yet that uh, that you'd like to talk about? Uh, now be the time. Oh yeah. We haven't talked about the fucking visuals and animation almost at all. We transitioned from production into themes. Now it's mm. the visuals time. Okay. This movie, I think, maybe I'm actually going to like double down on this. I think this is the best looking Miyazaki movie. So maybe it mm. has to do with like how amazing I think these designs are realized. We talked about them, these ornate, like intricate future visions of the 19th century designs and also like how the fucking rust punk humongous, like stumbling creature that is Howl's castle is such an intricately designed animation piece with so many moving parts and such an incredible aesthetic. Like that's probably what carries it very much, but there's also a tactical yeah. aspect to it, which I find remarkable because uh, from what I read, most of the uh, uh, character animation this is st still done with actual painted cells that were then digitized and then arranged digitally. So, like, they haven't even ditched cell animation at this point in 2004. <laughs> and that's fucking yeah. late yeah. into the game. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 um, I kind of agree. I, I think I'll have to give it a Ponyo a rewatch still. Like, that, that movie is also a visual absolute fucking marvel. I but, believe that's the first um, where they went full digital, but I guess we'll see when we get to the Ponyo cast. Yeah, but 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 I I, I can definitely see the argument, and I, I mentioned before when I talked about how like my general feelings on Howl's Moving Castle um, that um, th this movie is like a spectacle, like it it it's it's like like the the main appeal of it isn't necessarily it's like uh, it's story or it's thematic through line or or the uh, how relatable the main character is, anything l like that. The greatest appeal of this thing is just watching it and looking at it and listening to it. Yeah. Like it's, it's it's just every single, e even as the plot doesn't really like have a great connective tissue, the things that it connects to are just fantastic set pieces. Uh, oh yeah. From 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 the the fights that seem to like have double the frames of every, every other when uh, whenever Howl is escaping uh, the, the goo and, and the corrupted wizards to the little simple moments of like just doing the laundry with Turnip, the insanely appealing animation on Turnip Head. I mean, are you kidding? Yeah. That thing's <laughs> stiff, it can't move its limbs and it and yeah. it's still so charming. It's so weird. It, it is still so charming, so kinetic, but also like... Yeah, yeah it's amazing. The, the, the castle... Uh, from what I've read, consists of 80 individual, like, digital elements, basically, let's call them, because the castle was mainly animated, like, as a digital object, but as you can see, and it kind of reminded me of the animation of the Ohms in Nausicaa, where you had, like, these hugely detailed mm. creatures, but clearly, like, segmented, like, layered pieces yeah, that were moved yes. individually to have them contract and expand. You have a lot of Which this going like, on with this castle. 
It's, it's amazing because like it, it it looks like like the visual like clarity of any individual part looks like part of the background, but then it moves yeah. around and like comes alive and and it's yeah it's yeah, that like the the castle is an amazing creation. It's one of uh, Miyazaki's yeah. most the, iconic the way it uh, inventions. Is is so amazing the way there's so yeah. much life to the castle. And I gotta say, um, I don't know where to fit in bit, bit in, but I just want to say yeah, like the opening shot of this movie is like maybe the best opening shot in like any of the Ghibli library. It's oh yeah, this where, one where, where it's like emerges a fog from the clouds. slowly fades out and we see this field with little uh, sheep running around in it. It's like a little farmer. And then we see the castle like crawling like a, like a, like a little like wild beast across the meadow, across this landscape. And what's beautiful about it is the way that like, instead of this being like a big crazy like kaiju moment where everyone runs away, it like just holds this still shot and even the sheep and the farmer don't react. Like the castle is a perfectly natural feature of this world that yes, just like yes, is crawling yes. about like a like yeah. any other animal. I actually want that- to give a shout out to the whole opening sequence because it is so good at setting up where we are and who we're with. Like the the, the first shot, like you say, always already established like somewhat like like the technology level of, of like ordinary people. Yeah, we have shepherds out there in the fields. You have uh, the castle, which is a really insane thing, just being part of a normal world. And then we see the the town that uh, Sophie lives in, which is this like pretty idyllic, uh, like pan-European-esque village. Then we have the train coming through and this billowing smoke that, that like covers the beautiful view. Already we have the like themes of like industrialization and it's, conflict with with like the uh like the the idyllic landscape and uh and communal living and then we see sophie in the hat shop and we see through the window when the where like the smoke like covers uh the view but then you can also in the distance and and the the other girls in the hat shop pointed out you can see the castle over there in the distance but she doesn't really care about all that gossip about like uh, how who steals all your heart and the castle and stuff. She's focused on her work, and that's that's like the first forty seconds or something. Uh, yeah, it maybe like, so more like two good. minutes, but yeah, uh, that, that's yeah, okay. like a it, really, it really, a, really good. It takes good. its time. Also, right, but, yeah. it it makes it very. I guess this is the best way to also exemplify how the animation of the castle works because the very first shot we get of the castle walking towards the camera is a unique one but afterwards we have three shots falling each other where we see the castle from the same perspective which basically from the side so what we have here is like where usually in cell animation you obviously have an image you redraw it from a different perspective or with slight movement you redraw it redraw it redraw it here with the castle especially with these three shots which all show it from the same side we have it drawn once with a level of detail of like a very intricate background but like a uh, 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 cut into 80 different pieces and it's it's 80 i got that from the sources um and those are digitally manipulated and animated completely in the computer like not not by frame by frame redrawing it but instead by rearranging it and so they were able to reuse this highly de- detailed art in multiple shots whenever they showed the castle from the same side which they did in three shots subsequently uh, uh, in the very beginning of the film already mm. and they continue to do so later with different perspectives of the castle i think that's a highly unique way of like conceptualizing sort of how to animate this, how to put it into perspective and so on, that you have more in video games than you have in animation. Because in video games, you often have like interactive movement, but some older video games, especially 2D, 2D games, have a lot of animation of separate pieces, like very limited to some perspectives, like isometric or like flat 2D point and click adventures, where you have these, Machinarium is, is a game that has a similar animation style to House Moving Castle, actually, like the, the, the castle itself, where you have these intricate mechanical things that have been like pre drawn pieces and that are being animated like this. And this is, I, I like this. I love looking at this. It's really cool. Yeah, the, the castle, again, absolutely iconic, a, a marvel, uh, one of Miyazaki's great uh, just things to look at, along with like Totoro and, I don't know, the the, 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 I think the moon, the, the, the forest spirit. I don't know if we mentioned it before, I don't remember, Night but the, uh, the original conception of the castle as it is in the novel uh, is like a medieval, uh, a medieval fortress with 
four turrets, except for, and it's, and it's made of large bricks, except for there, instead of being, you know, uh, like, like, uh, you know, stone, uh, conventional stone, they're made of uh, black coal. Um, and then there's, you know, the flames billowing out of the, the tall, uh, parapets, uh, on top of the castle, but that's completely different than the imagery that Miyazaki gives us. And I think that it's just, it's really wonderful, uh, the way that he translated it into something that's more organic, something that's, it's walking on these spindly chicken legs. It's almost as if it's, it's almost as if, you know, <laughs> what's propping up uh, the castle or, you know, symbolically, you know, uh, Hal's ego is is the, these tiny, flimsy, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, legs. And uh, it's, you know, later on easily toppled. Um, yeah. Like the, the, th the thing that really is remarkable, especially ab about the castle is, like you said, it they made it up like this like it didn't have to be this way and like every single minute it's on screen and it's moving and we're seeing the insides and how it's jumbling around and when it's disintegrating over time at, at the finale it's one giant fucking animation flex like oh yeah every it's single always steals little the show. bit of the like scene. things falling off it and the way it leans and wobbles in every direction it's all just just for the sake of it, just for the sake of m making this thing that d alive that didn't have to be so complicated, but but of course it had to because they wanted it to, and it's I love and the it's scene better that way. Which, yeah. yeah, I love the scene in which it uh, they Sophie takes Markle and Turnip Head to the lake to do the laundry, and then they have their little lunch by the lake of you know bread with a slice of tomato on it, you know, and. They they come when they come to to stop the castle. There, the the castle sort of like starts to collapse and slunch slump down yeah, yeah. to like mm. take a rest. And it's just like a big creature like, that needs to. Yeah. yeah, it sort of like decompresses, you know, as it's as it's getting into its mode of relaxation. Yeah, yeah, and I, I gotta um, say, of course, we referenced many times the the castle can fly at the end, and it's like. Just such this obvious contrast where the the house is moving about like this creature and like everything feels like it's just almost falling off the house and then the house completely collapses and is destroyed. Perfect timing with end, the sound effect. It's, it's <laughs> right. Yeah, there we go. Comedic uh, bar smashing sound. Uh, but then at the end, it's uh it's flying and it's like so majestic. Even though it's still kind of big and ugly, the family has now made it like work properly and it's covered in like greenery as well to like a garden area it's open yeah. and it's just like it, it it's, gets, it's almost like yeah it's a whole metaphor for howls for yeah Howl exactly, himself exactly it gets and back to that like he, he has yeah. so much more like for, from mysterious and threateningly uh like walking through the fog and, and like being all guarded uh it, it becomes this like open thing that like soars through the sky and and, and it is is weird and quirky but like it's still it's still more homely in a way. Yeah, it's almost it's yeah. almost you know, whereas before it's it was, you know, uh sort of collapsing under its own weight. Uh which is yeah, not, I think, yeah. you know, the psychological now burden. Yeah. Now now it's weightless, exactly. It's 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 yeah, it's it's really wonderful. And also the the groundedness that is still necessary, right? Um to 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 the sense of, of security uh is is even though they're flying, they've taken the ground with them. They have the little garden. They have the the trees, you know, uh, and it's their own little, you know, yeah. family unit that is very grounded and yeah. and has stability. You know, it, they're not um, they're yeah, not well, running but, um, away from the world per se. They're just I don't know taking it with them, admiring the world. Yeah. Well, I, I like what what, what I'm. Trying to get at with um, like the the castle is like a model, but but I th I think like even even like every other part, even aside from from the castle, just it's so it's incredible. Like like the the character animation in this film is stunning. Every, nearly every character like morphs and transforms in strange and magical ways that still feel right and believable. Um, Oh, like that, that's, yeah, it, like it's, how Markle, it's so crazy. Yeah. 
Like even Marcus disguise is yes. just so so creative and weird. And it's um, sort of like his his mustache yeah. sprouts out of his face in this very yeah. almost like it's flowing water. He yeah. turns into the Cat King. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! No, <laughs> no, not him again. No, but um, uh... <laughs> yeah, but uh, there the, are the, all, all these little moments of like just extra effort to make something more appealing or stand out just a bit more with just with the design concepts that are added or with animation details that there's this scene mm. early in the movie after Sophie's transformed and is looking in the mirror it's it's the type of three uh like three three not three-way mirror but like three mirrors like like two on this on the sides and one ahead mm-hmm. which you'd use to, for for like cosmetics or or to work on something and look at it from all angles and they i don't think they cheated and did some like digital copy animation for that they straight up drew her like four times from four yeah. different angles when, when that was she really moved. showing off yeah yeah and and it's like you wouldn't even notice it unless you thought about it you're like hang on <laughs> that that has to be very difficult and they keep and they keep like adding these like little things uh, here and there and like 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 I said like the character animation and character designs are just amazing. The castle itself, the backgrounds are absolutely oh gorgeous. These like alpine uh, areas of all different like uh, shades and colors, and the weather and the the, the sky. Uh, w- whenever like you have storm clouds or the there's this short little moment near the end of the film actually uh, uh, right after the uh, the castle first collapses after she leaves it with Calcifer and and you see like um like uh she says like howl is out there fighting those things and you see the the ship falling down and you can like and it falls behind the uh the clouds which are like clearly background stuff and explodes and you can see the way the light cascades off the clouds it's oh. so right yeah. It's incredible, like that. Such a small moment gets like that amount of effort. Yeah, and I, and, and and once again, like this, I think is like what makes Hal stand out. Aside from its strange in betweenness between like have like plot heavy adventure and like n- structureless, uh, like evocative n- narrative thing, is yeah. like it's it, it's just. A visual and uh, and like oral uh, audio, I guess. Wonder, like once again, Joe Joe Hisaishi's score is mwah. it's it's it is. one of his and, best. And also the sound design is oh yeah absolutely amazing. Yeah, the, the way that the the castle moves and you can like the creaking, hear groaning the and clunking and the steam and you can yeah. feel like you can sense that there are some moving mechanisms going on that you don't see. Uh, like yeah, even yeah. even things like when they're inside of the castle and the, there's things going on outside, they can hear the creaking in the floorboards and in the, and in the the ceiling, uh, you know, beams and things like that. Like uh, there's just the the entire environment uh, is is kinetic and flexible, but it it's always giving off these you know these noises. Uh, it's yeah. it's great. I also think that and, uh, the way that light in in all of Miyazaki's films, but th- just light, the the light is always so right. It's always so natural looking and believable. It's something that is I think really hard to get down in animation. Yeah. And oh, oh my god, yeah, that that moment when uh when Hal is casting the spell to uh to transport the castle uh, and, and and like expand it and stuff. And these uh, these sparks of light like f- like whirl around him and around the other characters who are sitting there waiting. If you look at like it's obviously like a digital effect that's happening. That this this I don't think this would be possible with traditional cells. But the way that light effect interacts with every surface and every character mm. is just mind boggling for those like few frames that's happening. It's crazy. Yeah, and actually, just the the animation of Calcifer. Oh yes, yes, I mentioned him before. Like huge here's blue a blue and fire. Pink. Yeah, it looks almost more. It, it, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned that you know, or it was uh, it was hipster Cthulhu that mentioned that you know, in this instance of, of using magic, uh, it's like this pure, you know, uh, 
use of the power. So uh, there is no, you know, monstrification going on. But uh, but Calcifer is is like undergoing this, you know, almost like scary like transformation. But it's also a, a another little Easter egg to the to the novel because uh, the the most uh, like the, the the original illustrated cover of the Diana Wynne Jones novel had an illustration of Calcifer, yeah, that has uh, the same coloration as is used when they move the uh, when they when he moves the castle. So it's a little nod to to that original uh, okay. to that original illustration. The blue flame, that is, yeah. you mean. But uh, listen, the, speaking the of the sound, flame, right? uh, yeah. speaking of the sound design, like that, that's I, I've mentioned before how the magic in this movie is just like exactly how magic should be. But like the sound is also a huge part of that. Like whenever any like supernatural whoosh sound or whenever like some sort of sparks fly, they always sound exactly right as well. So I think good. we already said about the stars uh, and the scene of like yeah. catching the stars, but just all the time the stars appear. Like the animation on them is so perfect. Yeah, and again, the way the light cascades off the backgrounds and the characters, it's like, yeah, it's 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 crazy. And this this is like raw speculation on my on my behalf, but just the way the stars look kind of weirdly do remind me of stuff you would see in Hosoda's work. So I wonder if he like drew some sketches or something of how you would animate the stars originally. Oh, that just really reminds me of like Hmm, similar effects that he likes to use. Maybe Miyazaki's still some ideas. It was Miyazaki's dream, so I I think Miyazaki was responsible. might have just been inspired by Okay. Or maybe Hosoda stole. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine just Hosoda being fired and he takes like two armful of like concept papers with him, like just running, yelling. (laughs) That's what he's still basing his movies off of. Oh my yeah. gosh, <laughs> that the the oh that that scene with the with the falling stars is uh, obviously the moment when Hal catches the star is oh. is incredible. How how would the the sparks fly off in the in the it's it, there's both both like a musical and sound design cue to it. Um, but even before that, when when the star falls onto the lake and is is like dashing desperately across it's like this this spirit of like you know creative forcefulness but it but it soon like dies out and then it sinks into the water and it lingers on this little silhouette sinking down it's like i don't know there's something so so spooky and but magical but also yeah. sad about Mag- it magical is the word <laughs> absolutely but, yeah um i th- this is also like um do- doing that scene uh uh, Joe Hisaishi uh, repeats uh, a, an earlier motif, uh, which right. is like a, which is unique to Howl. Um, I think correct. I think the first time it's heard is when he comes home during the dream sequence, where where uh, we see like his feather lying there, and Sophie touches it and it disintegrates. That's the first time we right. hear that. And then she goes motif. into into his little room, but it's become a cave. Yeah, in that that track, by the way, is titled "Cave of Mind." Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, and, and, and w- once again, just another shout out to the, to the core, to the, to the main theme, uh, the, the, the waltz that, uh, that we hear at the start of the film yeah. and that, that first, like during the film proper shows up when they're like, um, flying above the, the, the parades when the house taking her on, on that first little flying trip. And it, and, and it becomes this, like, uh, this thing that, comes up in scenes between them and it can sound either like really like wistful and longing um or or, or it's like this joyous little fun thing that's happening it's it's it be, really it can be good. bombastic sometimes yeah it can yeah be yeah sensitive at other times yeah 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 i think you're right it's and it and i think that the the uh you know the the complex meter of of a waltz that 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 lilting feeling that feeling of constantly moving forward to the next bar it it uh, marries very well with the uh you know theme of of flight and of uh you know that sort of symbolizes their their love because every time they're they're flying to i mean they fly together multiple times in the movie yeah okay uh anyone else want to gush about yes. the animation no. some more? 
I have okay. something to wrap this up if uh, 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 as like the last point to discuss. No. <laughs> Not the last point. You still have something? Yes, I still have something. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay, so Playden mentioned that, that, like, mentioned the smoke and like industrialism and all that. Uh, th the smoke is like very oppressive in in the movie, and like I think that ties in into how like um, the fire in this universe is used. Like, uh, the smoke is obviously made by fire, and fire has the ability to both like keep this monstrous. Uh, the house, house alive, but it also has the ability to burn down like several, uh, j you know, cities. Um, and and it yeah. just depends yeah. on like if it's like you if it's in good hands or not. Quote I mean, unquote, K good hands. has that a uh, little kind of jokey line, but also kind of serious uh, when talking to Hal about the wizards losing their humanity out there. Like he hates the fire of gunpowder. It's so rude. <laughs> yeah, he said in the in the English yeah. he says those guys have no manners. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like yeah, that 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 actually is an expression of that exact like theme. And, and uh, I think it's like in addition to the whole like Miyazaki's duality of flight as this magical wonderful thing and also this tool of war. And you, right. we all now we also have like fire as either like the hearth. Or like the literally, the, literally the heart of the home, um, the thing right, keeping right. someone alive home and, and vitality is. and creativity, and then you have like, of course, the destructive fires of. But, bombs but I and think it's gunpowder. also curious because, uh, like, it is still an oppressive smoke in like over Howl's castle, um, but at the end, there's actually no smoke once it starts flying. Clean energy. <laughs> Green yeah. boys, and like, it's green. And like that, that clearly, like you know, messages out that um, there was also something wrong with Howl's Castle in that state. Obviously, yeah. there was, but yeah, it was self-destructive instead of uh, storytelling. It was self-destructive instead of self-sustaining. Mm. Mm. Just good like catch. Howl. Good observation. Yeah. Okay, right. that was it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's good. Good we got that uh, as well because that's absolutely a thing in the movie as well uh yeah. and, and it, it's one of the undercurrents one of the many undercurrents of uh, of the movie is like the whole uh, industry versus like the like the, the home and and the old magic um yeah which like like Howl's moving castle has so many themes <laughs> it's got mm. so many things on uh, on its mind at True. once and i think like my big question when like when all said and done, and the big question like I had when I went in into it, uh, rewatched it a couple of times for this po uh, podcast, is like, do does it like hold together in a meaningful way? Does does it get at something, or is is it is it too scattered to really like stick the landing? That was my big question going I into this. Uh, well, uh, what 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 uh, what, what are you uh, your feelings on it? Well, my feelings are that it absolutely sticks the landing. I think that though it's, it is a, uh, a choppy flight, so to speak, you know, it, it's, it's bumpy. There's turbulence going through this movie. Um, but it, but it does land and it, and it, and it sort of is this, this journey in which the, uh, similar to a uh, a flight in which you know there is you know natural forces working against uh you know the the safe landing of the plane if if you just manage to land safe you you kind of even if it, it's not the question isn't was that landing earned <laughs> it was <laughs> thank god we made it here okay right? yeah well, the, and, the, the and in a way a, i i feel the yeah. same about the ending of this film it's just it it's it takes so many different, you know, vignettes and and impressions. It's really chaotic. It's almost uh, Miyazaki is is flailing about violently in with his creativity, but also with his you know his internal uh, you know struggles and 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 feelings, uh, and just trying to you know, expunge them, trying to cleanse himself. And I think this movie 
in in a very messy way just how the, the Howl's castle starts out messy but and and the way Sophie cleans it is very chaotic but it's very forceful and that's very much what this movie is like it's it's a very forceful and chaotic cleansing experience and yeah, it's like uh, bless this mess is, is this your mess. take <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i find myself agreeing mostly with susan napier on the topic of like how does it come together what does it mean and i quoted this earlier just to uh, reference it again that it is more poetic than narrative with while it strings together a tapestry of images to create a multifaceted whole and i think this podcast has showed us how we kept looking at these images and brought out what this multifaceted whole contains in terms of things we can say about it. Um, I think we have sometimes an expectation to get it all neatly tied up with a bow in a plot that resolves and makes sense to us. But I think just looking at the images has from the start been Miyazaki's style. Often when he talked about animating scenes and especially in Spirited Away, he talked about this a lot. It was him creating scene by scene, thinking what does he want this image, this scene, this movement to feel like? And that what happened next was actually kind of kind of up for grabs usually because he was just doing that when he got to that scene. And so in this sense, all of his work has always been to some degree dense images with a lot of ideas in them. And this is the same, but brought to like its logical extreme, I feel like. Yeah, it's patchwork, but it's, you know, it's, it's cobbled together. And that's... Uh, you know, cobbled together. Like the a, moving castle. Yeah. <laughs> like the moving castle. Yeah, I was waiting for something. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's, I mean, that, that, that's part of my ultimate take on it uh, as well. Um, like, I've, I, I'm, like, I, I, I still think that this, I still think this might be my least favorite of Miyazaki's films. Um, it is merely very excellent. Yes. It is merely very, <laughs> very excellent. Exactly. Um, it is great. I, 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 yeah, and, and and I think while while you're absolutely right that Miyazaki's style has always been about like finding th- these amazing this is amazing imagery uh, and showing it to us uh, in a way, um, I think what's lacking from Hal's Moving Castle is is this um, is, is any moment of transcendence where the wonder of the image fits exactly with the wonder of the story. Um, I think the closest thing in, in this film is the uh, the, the falling stars uh, sequence, which um, is beautiful and evocative, and I am not surprised it came to him in a dream because that's it, it's it, it has that quality. Um, Miyazaki but, even has high quality dreams. Yeah. But 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 <laughs> watching it, like it, it's it's not until we like really start discussing and dissecting it that that it becomes clear what exactly like plot wise and character arc wise is going on it's yeah. not clear in the moment which i think honestly taps it of the potential uh like uh the the, the potential power it could have had um and I, uh, and i think that's uh that might be like like my hesitation about Hal's moving castle uh, it's mm-hmm. not that because like it really really is beautiful I don't like, know. I don't yeah. know if I agree, Playden. I think mm-hmm. that um, it's, like, it's obviously it's, you have a you had a different experience with it than I had. <laughs> I know. I did yeah. exactly. Um, I I kind of well, want to dovetail into one of the another quote from the the one uh, interview that we were able to find a transcript for. If um, I can briefly add, oh, yeah, uh, just okay, sure. Um, I think that just makes it more rewatch funny. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You, you no, can no, no, see no, this one true. a million times without, like, yeah. Yeah, you, there's always something new to to engage with. I mean, even though I had seen this film, um, you know, dozens of times uh, over the years, in rewatching it the last two times in preparation for this podcast, I mean, I kept on finding new things. Um, but I wanted to to read just one question and one response in this Newsweek. Uh, interview, Devin Gordon asks Miyazaki, or he says, the film doesn't follow Western storytelling conventions. And Miyazaki responds, a lot of people say they don't understand the film. And what that means is just that they have a set definition of how a story is supposed to be told. When the story betrays their anticipations, then they complain, which I find ridiculous. My (laughs) father in his old age only watched TV programs where he could figure out the story in the first three minutes. He'd say, I can understand this. 
I can follow it. But I think it's a waste of time to try to change people. <laughs> Man, did, did, did I just you get... can't be changed. <laughs> well, I guess, I, I, guess I'll, I'll, I guess I'll have to walk into the ocean now. I just got, <laughs> got blown the fuck out by Miyazaki. Um, no, no, but like uh, my disagreement isn't with the lack of structure. Uh, because like Miyazaki has made films with literally no structure. See uh, My Neighbor Totoro. Um, and they work perfectly well. Uh, I think... Uh, I, I I just think that like Howl's Moving Castle is going for this structuralist fairy tale thing, while also, uh, like mentioned before, having all the, these plot threads going on and the and characters wanting things and doing specific things to achieve them. Uh, except that it's always always like kind of obscure how exactly it works because it's fucking magic, you know. Um, and it's weird in that way. And that weirdness is part of the charm, obviously, but but I think it, it, it also can get, get not necessarily in the way of the movie working, because I think it works. It is very excellent. Um yeah. but like but, but but at least keeps it from being the best it could possibly be, which is a compliment to it. It is so filled to the brim with uh with amazing evocative uh, scenes and concepts. Um, and and th- that's why I like when I described it as a spectacle. I do not mean to say it's an empty spectacle. What I mean to say is right. like the core of the thing is to like to marvel at it, to to, to have the the series of amazing sequences that like feel really good. But um, uh, and 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 that's what keeps it together, you know. That's that, that's that's why my my conclusion isn't that oh this thing like it, it's a patchwork that just falls apart and I don't like it and I and it's not structured right and I can't relate to it. I think like my my conclusion is as Niart said, it's like the castle itself. Like this movie is bursting to the seams with with creative energy, um, with a sort of strange lag of direction that uh that that's uncommon for Miyazaki's works uh he always manages to focus it like boil it down and focus it here it's just it's just everywhere and that's in a way it's a weakness but in a way it's also like a strength because like you said every scene has something cool in it and there's always new things to like think about or talk about or explore which is why we've been talking for over three hours <laughs> yeah um, I'll concede that it's, yeah. it is I think overly dense for <laughs> It to be of, it's it's a movie that's almost impossible to make sense of on the first viewing. Yeah. Um, it's it's able to yeah. be you know impressionistic and you know emotionally evocative through yeah. the visuals, which I don't think is necessarily a core to the film, uh, but I consider it a hook. Yeah, right? yeah. It, it's, and I do um, think that it is the it is the the string that 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 strings together all of these beads, these vignettes, and all of these different patchwork imagery uh, and and storytelling beats is the visuals and 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 the spectacle. But I don't yeah, think that's the it, core. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, the core it's, it's is compelling just, and uh, it's too yeah. chaotic uh, for for one viewing. It has to be viewed multiple times. Um, but I think that's also something that. Miyazaki couldn't help doing because he had this novel to adapt that is already extremely layered and dense. And then he added another element on top of it with, with, while <laughs> yeah. trying not to sacrifice anything core to the original. So in the end, you know, this is a movie that probably could have had all of its themes explored uh, even better and have a more narratively cohesive experience uh in three hours rather than just two but i mean already two hours is a very long film and um i i think that part of the beauty of the film is that it is all of these ideas condensed into something that is beautiful and chaotic but with lots of energy just like a little fire that symbolizes creativity and freedom, and it has lots of heart. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, that, that, that's also what was was going to be part of my closing remarks. Is like, yeah. 
may, may, maybe less like I'm less head over heels for it. Um, but 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 still, what really like the biggest marvel of of the film is isn't even like the castle itself or the amazing character animation and design or the backgrounds or the effects of this of the score. It's the fact that it even holds together at all. And like it holds together because of the heart at its center, just yeah, like exactly. the castle holds together yes. because of Calcifer yes. at the center. It's, We've been playing like, hearts a lot. There's like a Kingdom Hearts yeah. game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To me, this movie is yeah. like very Miyazaki core and in turn also very Ghibli core because of all those things. Yeah. Okay. All right. So those I, are my I, I I still don't think that Howl's is anywhere near the best Miyazaki, but it might in some way be the most Miyazaki. <laughs> yeah. it's pretty good yeah so that's uh that's the bottom line i think it's the favorite of the man himself so you know who, yeah who yeah to, that says something that's this margin yeah and 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 it seems like according to the original author that he found he he connects with some core of the story that no one else has which is such a like so, so, such a like beautiful little thing like even that fact should be enough to justify like the the movie's existence, even aside from the way it delights its, its audience, the fact that it delighted its uh, original creator in such a way, I think that's a really beautiful thing. It's powerful because it's true. Well, I think um, I think that about does it for uh, the Norsecast's discussion of Hal's moving castle. Um, where. It's it's been a long and uh, and very fruitful discussion, uh, I think, um, and uh, I'd uh, like to give a give a shout out to all my uh, my co-hosts here, and especially Nyad, whose channel this is, and Yay. I'm obviously I'm filling in as moderator uh, once again. Uh, Thank you for that. It's it's his official title. Uh, I'm a executive moderator, some acting moderator, whatever you call Indeed. it. Indeed. Um. But uh, do uh, check out our uh, Patreon where you can uh, uh, donate to uh, keep this thing uh, going, keep this thing hosted on uh, all the platforms uh, that you you might be listening uh, to it on right now. Uh, that's uh, through Lipsyn, uh, it goes out to Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen uh, to podcasts. Um, and you like can and you can yeah please like the if video you're YouTube, uh, if yeah. you're on YouTube. <laughs> Please, uh, please subscribe. Smash that like button. Ring like, the bell. Just absolutely destroy the fucking bell. Just demolish it. Um, and uh, and g- give us a comment and uh, what's the best uh, thing about this movie to you? And uh, we have do, a Discord. Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> yes, we also have a Discord. Seven, uh, yeah. Where where you can uh, talk to uh, any of us uh, about like anything, but like obviously we're all down to talk about. Ghibli movies, but you already knew that. That's why you're listening. Um, get it, get in yeah. before we do Earthsea. We want some lively yeah. discussion. <laughs> yeah. Earthsea Next time before. around, it's gonna be uh, Earthsea. Uh, the first work which, by Miyazaki's very own son, Goro Miyazaki. Goro Miyazaki. Uh, a- another adaptation of a, a novel from out west, uh, Ursula Le Guin. Right. Exactly. And uh, the the only Ghibli movie I would describe as infamous. Oh, <laughs> that's probably true. Yeah. So that's gonna Yikes. that's gonna be fun. I mean, <laughs> we're gonna mount a strong defense as always. We're gonna try to polish and shine them, even like the yeah. the weaker ones. But let's just say there's an infamous moment, yeah. an infamous clip of Miyazaki being very very disappointed after seeing his son's film. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say thank you to you all for having me on this episode. Thank you for uh, being on. You've yeah, been it was, a delight. It was our pleasure. You know, and yeah. a great help. Thank you. And I and I hope to be back again sometime. Maybe absolutely. not for Earthsea since I uh, absolutely just <laughs> do not <laughs> okay, don't, care don't, for that not, movie. Not, <laughs> but, don't don't uh, poison the world. You know, maybe, maybe another time. We'll figure something yeah. out. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's goodbye from here. Uh, and uh, remember... A heart's a heavy burden. Watch Wallace and Gromit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll Curse of the Were Red. Next, yes. next episode, Wallace and Gromit. We'll Curse of the Were Red. Episode, voice. Yeah, like, like, yeah, yeah, watch that. I need really need to rewatch that movie because, like, the House Movie Castle is Miyazaki's favorite of his own films, but he would still rather talk about Wallace and Gromit. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, that, I mean that's that's the greatest endorsement. Like, <laughs> donate to our Patreon for for endorsement. a stretch goal of a special episode on Wallace and Gromit. Okay, bye, bye, yeah. <laughs> okay. goodbye. Bye. Bye.